You're watching WCCO News, always streaming on CBS News Minnesota. Thanks for joining us on CBS News Minnesota as we bring you live streaming coverage of the Apple River Valley stabbing trial. Uh, we do want to give you a little bit of background information before we take you into the courtroom. First, we'll tell you that Nikolai Mew is charged with first degree intentional homicide from a stabbing that killed 17 year old Isaac Schumann and wounded four others on the Apple River in Wisconsin. This happened in 2022, that July. The prosecution argues that Mew was the aggressor by stabbing the five tubers. Mew pleaded not guilty to all charges. His attorneys will argue that the act was in self-defense as he feared for his life after the tubers accused him of harassing girls on the river. Now, before we go live into the state county uh, courthouse in Hudson for opening statements, I do want to bring in WCCO legal analyst Joe Tamburino, who's going to be with us throughout our coverage here on CBS News Minnesota. Joe, let's talk about some of what we expect to hear. Obviously, there will be contested facts from various witnesses, but then there's also the video of what we understand was a chaotic scene and then a lot of tight talk about the weapon, which was a knife. Yes, you're right, Derek, on all of those issues. I would imagine that both sides are going to come out strong in their opening statements. Uh, from the prosecution, they're going to come out saying, look, there were other things that Mr. Mew could have done rather than getting his knife and stabbing these individuals. They will also make a lot of basically arguments about who started with the knife? Did Mr. Mew bring it to the scene or did he get it from somewhere else? The prosecution's gonna argue he had it the whole time and they will likely bring up the fact that Mr. Mew's wife, according to what we know in the complaint, also said that he had a knife. From the defense, they're gonna come out swinging by saying, look, he was cornered. There was no place for him to go. He was being pushed into the water, and so he had to defend himself. He thought his life was in danger. So I believe that's where both sides are going to come out. What sort of pretrial motions has Judge Michael Waterman already ruled on in this case? Two very important motions. One, he sided with the state. One, he sided with the defense. From the state's perspective, he sided with them on the issue as to whether they could completely play with audio the video in question. One of the people, one of the uh, victims, uh, associates, people who were with the victims, was recording this situation. Not all of it, but he got a lot of it on tape. And so the prosecution wants to play that whole video and audio. The defense said, well, the last approximately one minute really is too prejudicial, it's too emotional. But the judge disagreed. So the entire audio and video is going to come in. From the defense side, the judge agreed with the defense that if the defendant says that he's a peaceful person, basically raise character evidence that he's a peaceful person, not a violent person, the state can sure question him on that and try to rebut that, but they can't bring up the fact that he had a machete in his car. So the judge ruled with the state that they could play the video, and the judge ruled with the defense that no one can bring up the fact that he had a machete in the car. How much do you think impairment is going to be a factor in the arguments that we hear? It's going to be a very significant factor because anytime you have an issue of using alcohol or drugs, what comes into play is this. Can you actually remember and relate the facts and if you were under the influence at the time of when the situation happened, did you have the best judgment? Were you able to actually act correctly within the law? So both sides are going to address that issue. From the prosecution, they might argue that since Mr. Mew admits to drinking a lot of beer, and we don't know how much or what his test level is, they could argue that he was under the influence. From the defense side, they would have to argue that though he admits to drinking a lot of beer, he was not so inebriated or drunk that he didn't know what was happening. It also relates to wondering what was the thought process, why Mr. Mew didn't walk away, why the tubers didn't walk away, and who actually initiated the confrontation and why. But you're exactly right on both counts. Uh, let's take the last, uh, what you just said, and, and about who initiated this confrontation. Because in Wisconsin, as in most states, if you provoke or start a fight, basically, you can't use self-defense except for some, you know, very unique circumstances. So if, in fact, somebody provoked this fight, it's important to know who. 
If it was the tubers, well, that's going to help Mr. Mew. If it was Mr. Mew, well, that's not going to help him. So who provoked or started this is going to be important. And secondly, obviously, you're right. Your judgment could be impaired if you're consuming some type of alcohol and or drugs. Also wondering about what led the tubers to characterize him, and I, and I don't know if I have the exact wording here, but as looking for little girls on the river that day. And we don't know that. Uh, according to the complaint, there seems to have been some type of confrontation based on supposedly Mr. Mew putting on some goggles or snorkel gear. Now, Mr. Mew, according to what we know in the complaint, said, well, he was looking for a friend's phone who the friend's phone presumably landed in the river. From the tuber's point of view, according to what we know in the complaint, uh, they found whatever he was doing with the snorkel gear to be suspicious, and they called him some names about if he was looking for little girls. But we don't know what actually started that. And it's been you know almost two years, so obviously both sides have had an opportunity to really hone their case and, and decide how they're going to present. What do you think is going to be the key to answering some of the big questions that these 12 jurors have uh, as this case gets underway? Well, the state has the burden of proof. They have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Mew did these crimes, didn't act in self-defense. So I would imagine they're going to come out strong starting to call witnesses. They could start right off the bat with calling victims. Then they could start with some type of investigator, uh, police officers, first responders. They could do all of that, and I'm sure they're going to start with that. From the defense side, they potentially will call Mr. Mew because it's really important in a self-defense case for the defendant himself to get in front of the jury and say, here's why I had to act in self-defense. So I think that's how this will play out over the next week or so. All right, well, it appears that things are getting underway in that St. Croix courtroom. We're going to take you there now live. Um, those are the two things I have on my list. Um, oh, one more thing. Mr. Anderson, how long do you expect to take during your opening? I think about 40 minutes, Judge. Okay. So what I'll probably do is um, give the preliminary instructions, state opening statement. We'll take a short recess, uh, and then we'll come back in for the defense opening statement. That way we break up the afternoon a little bit. Yes, and then are we taking a break after my opening before we do anything else? Um, probably not. I think we'll just roll right into witnesses after that. Yeah, the plan after uh, just a, my understanding is the first thing the state's going to do is mark the video in the frames from that video as evidence. Uh, we have no objection to its being admitted without a witness. And then it's my understanding they're going to ask to publish it. We have no objection to their publishing it immediately before okay. we have any witnesses. So I know that's a little unusual. I just thought we'd give your honor a heads up. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mr. Nelson, you'll be giving the opening statement? Yes. And you'll be giving yours, Mr. Anderson? Yes. For our side, Judge, who's ever in this chair is going to be the one doing whatever's next. So Same? We'll try to, but... Um, okay. Yes. We'll do our best, then. We'll at least... Let you know. All right. Let's bring the jury in. We have one, uh, yeah, that, that's your. All right, please be seated. All right, members of the jury. Good afternoon. Welcome back. Uh, the first order of business is to administer the jury oath. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to stand one more time, raise your right hand, and the clerk will administer the oath. 
Do you swear that you will, well and truly, try the issue joined in the matter announced by the court, and unless discharged by the court, a true verdict given according to the law and to the evidence given in court? So help you out. Please have a seat. All right. Uh, members of the jury, uh, before the trial begins, there are certain instructions you should have to better understand your functions as a juror and how you should conduct yourself during the trial. Uh, I am going to read these instructions aloud. I've also published them on the monitors, uh, so you are welcome to follow along if you'd like. Your duty is to decide the case based only on the evidence presented at trial and the law given to you by the court. Anything you may see or hear outside the courtroom is not evidence. All people deserve fair treatment in our system of justice, regardless of their race, national origin, religion, age, ability, gender identity, sexual orientation, education, income level, or any other personal characteristic. People make assumptions and form opinions uh, from their own personal backgrounds and experiences. Generally, we are aware of these things, but you should consider the possibility that you have biases uh, of which you may not be aware, which can affect how you evaluate information and make decisions. You must carefully evaluate the evidence and resist any urge to reach a verdict that is influenced by any bias for or against any party, witness, or attorney. Personal opinions, preferences, or biases have no place in a courtroom where our goal is to treat all parties equally and to arrive at a just and proper verdict based on the evidence. Do not begin your deliberations and discussion of the case until all of the evidence is presented and I have instructed you on the law. Do not discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else until your final deliberations in the jury room. This order is not limited to face-to-face -face conversations. It also extends to all forms of electronic communications. Do not use any electronic devices, such as a mobile phone or computer, text or instant messaging, or social networking sites, to send or receive any information about this case or your experience as a juror. But we will stop or recess from time to time during the trial. You may be excused from the courtroom when it is necessary for me to hear legal arguments from the lawyers. If you come in contact with the parties, lawyers, or witnesses, do not speak with them. For their part, the parties, lawyers, and witnesses will not contact or speak with the jurors. Do not listen to any conversation about this case. Do not research any information that you personally think might be helpful to you in understanding the issues presented. Do not investigate this case on your own or visit the scene either in person or by any electronic means. Do not read any newspaper reports or listen to any news reports on radio, television, over the internet, or any other electronic application or tool about this trial. Do not consult dictionaries, computers, electronic applications, social media, the internet, or other reference materials for additional information. Do not seek information regarding the public records of any party or witness in this case. Any information you obtain outside the courtroom could be misleading, inaccurate, or incomplete. Relying on this information is unfair because the parties would not have the opportunity to refute, explain, or correct it. Do not communicate with anyone about this trial or your experience as a juror while you are serving on this jury. Do not use a computer, cell phone, or other electronic device, including personal wearable electronics, applications or tools with communication capabilities to share any information about this case. For example, do not communicate by telephone, blog post, email, text message, instant message, social media post, or in any other way on or off the computer. Do not permit anyone to communicate with you about this matter, either in person, electronically, or by other means. If anyone does, despite your telling them not to, you should report that to me. 
I appreciate that it is tempting when you go home in the evening to discuss this case with other members of your household, but you may not do so. This case must be decided by you, the jurors, based on the evidence presented in the courtroom. People not serving on this jury have not heard the evidence, and it is improper for them to influence your deliberations and decision in this case. After this trial is completed, you are free to communicate with anyone in any manner. These rules are intended to assure that jurors remain impartial throughout the trial. If any juror has reason to believe that another juror has violated these rules, you should report that to me. If jurors do not comply with these rules, it could result in a new trial involving additional time and significant expense to the parties and the taxpayers. You are to decide the case solely on the evidence offered and received at trial. Evidence is, first, the sworn testimony of witnesses, both on direct and cross-examination, regardless of who called the witness. Second, the exhibits the court has received, whether or not an exhibit goes to the jury room. Third, any facts to which the lawyers have agreed or stipulated, or which the court has directed you to find. It is not necessary that every fact be proved directly by a witness or an exhibit. A fact may be proved indirectly by circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence is evidence from which a jury may logically find other facts according to common knowledge and experience. Circumstantial evidence is not necessarily better or worse than direct evidence. Either type of evidence can prove a fact. Attorneys for each side have the duty and the right to object to what they consider are improper questions asked of witnesses and to the admission of other evidence which they believe is not properly admissible. You should not draw any conclusions from the fact an objection was made. By allowing testimony or other evidence to be received over the objection of counsel, the court is not indicating any opinion about the evidence. You, the jurors, are the judges of the credibility of the witnesses and the weight of the evidence. You are not required to, but you may take notes during this trial, except during the opening statements and the closing arguments. Uh, the court will provide you with materials. In taking notes, you must be careful that it does not distract you from carefully listening to and observing the witnesses. You may rely on your notes to refresh your memory during your deliberations. Otherwise, keep them confidential. After the trial, the notes will be collected and destroyed. Uh, you will not have a copy of the written transcript of the trial testimony available for use during your deliberations. Therefore, you should pay careful attention to all of the testimony because you must rely primarily on your memory of the evidence and the testimony introduced during the trial. It is the duty of the jury to scrutinize and to weigh the testimony of witnesses and to determine the effect of the evidence as a whole. You are the sole judges of the credibility, that is, the believability, of the witnesses and of the weight to be given to their testimony. In determining the credibility of each witness and the weight you give to the testimony of each witness, consider these factors. Whether the witness has an interest or lack of interest in the result of this trial, the witness's conduct, appearance, and demeanor on the witness stand, the clearness or lack of clearness of the witness's recollections, the opportunity the witness had for observing and for knowing the matters the witness testified about, the reasonableness of the witness's testimony, the apparent intelligence of the witness, bias or prejudice if any has been shown, possible motives for falsifying testimony, and all other facts and circumstances during the trial which tend either to support or to discredit the testimony. Then give to the testimony of each witness the weight you believe it should receive. In your determination of credibility, you must avoid any and all bias based on a witness's race, national origin, religion, age, ability, gender identity, sexual orientation, education, income level, or any other personal characteristic. There is no magic way for you to evaluate the testimony, 
Instead, you should use your common sense and experience. In everyday life, you determine for yourselves <clears throat> the reliability of things people say to you, and you should do the same thing here. The state has charged Mr. Mew with six crimes that allegedly happened in St. Croix County, Wisconsin on July 30, 2022. Uh, in count one, uh, first degree intentional homicide. In counts two through five, attempted first degree intentional homicide. In count six, battery. Uh, Mr. Mew has pled not guilty to all charges. He alleges that he acted in self-defense. Mr. Mew is not required to prove his innocence. The law presumes every person charged with the commission of an offense to be innocent. This presumption requires a finding of not guilty unless in your deliberations you find it is overcome by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Mew is guilty. The burden of establishing every fact necessary to constitute guilt is upon the state. Before you can return a verdict of guilty, the evidence must satisfy you beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Mew is guilty. Because the state has the burden of proof, the state is allowed to present its evidence first. When the state has completed its evidence, Mr. Mew may, but is not required to, present evidence. If he presents any evidence, the state is allowed to present evidence in response to that called rebuttal evidence. We've now reached the stage where the attorneys will deliver their opening statements. The purpose of an opening statement is to give the lawyers an opportunity to tell you what they expect the evidence will show, so that you will better understand the evidence as it is introduced during the trial. I must caution you, however, that the opening statements are not evidence. Uh, first, we'll hear from the state, then we'll probably take a short recess, and then we'll hear from the defense. Uh, Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Judge. Senseless and horrific acts of violence when all Nikolai had to do was walk away. That's what you're going to see in this case. You'll see he eventually did walk away, but not until after stabbing five people. As Judge Waterman said, my name is Carl Anderson. My co-counsel, Brian Smestad, and I represent the state of Wisconsin in this case. It's our duty to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Nikolai Mew is guilty of all charges. <clears throat> You're going to hear in this trial that Nikolai said it was self-defense. But there's a video of what happened. You're going to see the video. You're going to see the sequence of events. You're going to hear a lot in the video. You're going to hear people yelling at Nikolai over 20 times some version of get away, go away. You hear the boys, the teenagers yelling, get away, get away from us, get the fuck away, get back. Get away from us, walk away, walk away. You're gonna hear that there's another group of tubers, adults, who hear this and come over to help the boys. You're gonna hear them yelling, go, get your ass and go, go, get your ass and go, 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 go. You're gonna hear that Isaac's group and the group of adult tubers, I'll probably refer to them as the Carlson group throughout the trial, didn't know each other, still don't know each other. You're gonna hear from both of those groups testify about what they saw. 
You can hear that there's six victims in this case. One that was punched, five that were stabbed, and you're gonna hear from all those victims except Isaac Schumann. That's because on July 30th of 2022, Nikolai Mew killed him. It was the summer before Isaac's senior year of high school. He was living in Stillwater, Minnesota with his mom, stepdad, brother, and stepsister. He was looking forward to going to college after high school. The photo on his left is his last school photo from his junior year of high school. The photo in the middle was his last birthday. He went out to celebrate at a restaurant with his family when he turned 17. The photo on the right, he was showing off the new trailer he bought to his mom for his new car detailing business. On July 3rd, 2022, it was a nice day. The weather was in the 80s, perfect sunny day for tubing. You'll see body cam, but it was busy. There was a lot of tubers on the river. Isaac was tubing with five of his best friends. Alex Fang, Juwan Cockfield, Owen Peliquin, Ryan Nelson, Landon Wire. And the last photo is Isaac. His friends called him Bike. These are, you'll see, uh, this is how they were dressed when they were on the river. These are screen grabs from that day. The other group you hear a lot about is the Carlson Group. The only one who was stabbed out of Isaac's group was Isaac. The rest of the people stabbed and punched were from the Carlson Group. Riley Madison was stabbed. Dante Carlson was stabbed. AJ Martin was stabbed. Tony Carlson was stabbed. Madison Cohen was punched. The other group you'll hear a lot about is Nikolai Mew's group. Some of these folks you'll hear more about than others, likely. Ariel, you'll see him in the video of the incident. Gilma, I expect you'll hear testimony from her. Eric Von Williams, you may see in some body cam, hear testimony. Nikolai Mew, that's Sandy Mew, Nikolai's wife at the time. Ernesto, you'll see in the incident video also. So Nikolai and Ernesto worked together. Um, a lot of these other people knew Nikolai through Ernesto or just met at Nikolai that day. Sergio, was he's the far right. He wasn't actually in this picture, but he was the last member of their group. So all these groups were tubing on the Apple River. They're all out with friends. They're all drinking. This is a map of the Apple River. Tubers started at River's Edge up on the top right, and they kind of tube in this snaky U shape down and then left and up. A lot of the tubers stop and did stop in this case at the hideaway. There's a bar there, there's a beach spot to hang out. The incident, the stabbings, occurred shortly before the tubers reached the 35 bridge that crosses over the river. In my area referred to as the Sunrise Bridge. And then the place where tubers exit is called the Village Park Exit. And you'll hear that the only group of these three groups that made it to the exit was Nikolai's group. You'll hear that shortly before the incident, Ariel's phone got knocked in the water. It was in a waterproof case. You'll hear testimony that he wasn't that worried about it. He said he has insurance for his phone but Nikolai insisted on looking for it. 
So the group ends up waiting at the sand, out of the sandbar. Nikolai goes downstream. He's got goggles and snorkel. He's going to look for the phone. Isaac's group is tubing a ways downstream. And you'll hear them describe that this older guy is tubing next to their tubes in extremely shallow water, getting really close to them, not really saying anything. He's got a, we all describe, we'll describe a strange look in his face. They're creeped out by him. You'll hear from several of them that he said something about looking for little girls. You'll hear from one or two that he said something about looking for a phone. Jawan, second from the left, filmed the main video in this case. He also filmed a nine second video shortly before that main video. <clears throat> and in that nine second video, you'll see Juwan saying, he said he's looking for little girls, he's a raper. And Nikolai is walking away. He doesn't keep walking away. At the end of that video, he stops and he turns around. Two seconds later is when that main video starts. The video of the stabbings. <clears throat> You'll see at that start of the main video, Nikolai is walking towards the group of tubers. They're down in their tubes, the teenage boys, Isaac's group. In the beginning, when Nikolai's walking towards him, he's got his hand down on a pocket on the right of his shorts. You'll hear from people from his group that that's where he kept his knife. You'll see in the video that this, he then starts to run. He runs at the boys who are down on their tubes. That's the only time in this video you'll see Nikolai run when he runs up on the group of teenage boys. He doesn't even run after stabbing five people. He walks away. There's his hand on that pocket. He's carrying a snorkel and goggles. That group in the background there, in the middle photo, that's the Carlson's group and eventually come over in response to the yells of the kids. Nikolai puts his goggles in his mouth and grabs onto their tubes with two hands. You'll hear in the video, the boys are yelling, whoa, whoa, what's this guy doing, weirdo? You can see their reactions in the video. That's Alex Vang on the left. Nikolai drops his goggles and snorkel in the water. He then starts reaching in the water where they fall into the water. He starts walking around their tubes. They're yelling at him, get away, get away from us, walk away. They're also chirping at him. You'll hear Juwan saying, he's a pedophile. Nikolai says something back, you can't hear it in the video. He's standing, now Nick, this is facing downriver. So the direction they're tubing, that's that bridge going over the river in the back, background. Boys are yelling, get away. That's Isaac in the middle photo with the white half, purple chunks. That's Isaac again on the left photo, standing with his hands up, fingers splayed. You can see a gold bracelet on his left wrist. You'll see that again later in the video. At this point in the video, you hear the boys start to cheer. And that's because the, you'll hear from them that the Carlsons, some adults, were coming over to help. Those two people you see walking over are Madison and Dante. Madison's later punched, Dante's later stabbed. There's Isaac's bracelet. As Madison is walking over, she's yelling, go, go, go. Nikolai says, you'll hear it in the video, they took my snorkel. Madison's pointing and yelling for him to go. You can see in that pocket on his shorts, a metallic clip. His 
pocket knife. Madison's pointing and yelling at him to go. Nikolai turns his back to her, looks back at the group of boys in the right photo. She directs him back away from the boys back to her. You hear from her, that's why she went over them in the first place, was to try to get him away from the boys. She keeps telling him to go. He starts smiling. He waves upstream towards his group. More women from the Carlson group come over. That's Riley in the middle, in that middle photo. She ends up getting stabbed. Right photo, you can see Nikolai puts his hand on that knife in his pocket again. He's smiling. The boys are laughing. They're drunk 17-year-old boys. They have nothing in their hands, as you'll see in the video. They're laughing and pointing at Nikolai. He's smiling. And then you'll see his hands start moving. You can't quite see what they're doing. You can see they come together in front of his waist. You can see behind him, there's nothing but clear and empty water. As Madison and Riley, two women, are talking to him, telling him to leave, he takes out his knife. He opens it blade up, still smirking, looking straight at the women. You'll not see Nikolai raise his knife and brandish it. You'll not hear him yell at anyone to get back. You'll not see him say anything at this point in the video after he takes his knife out. You'll not see him try to take a step back or walk away. You will see him looking around, smirking, while continuing to hold the knife down by his side. While holding the knife, he looks around, looks back over at the boys. You can see Riley leaning over, trying to keep his attention. Nothing but clear water behind him. You'll see Madison's got sunglasses on. It's more people from the Carlson group come over. That's AJ in the yellow swim trunks. He gets ultimately stabbed, you'll see. That's Dante in the right photo. He gets stabbed. This entire video is three minutes and 23 seconds long. It's not a very long video, but from the point in the video when witnesses say Nikolai punched Madison until you see Nikolai walking off after having stabbed five people, it's only about 20 to 25 seconds. It happens very fast in the video. You'll see that when you see it played in real time. You'll see the boys are loud, they're boisterous. You'll hear that in the video. There's a lot of yelling. Pedophile is looking for little girls. Go, get away from us. You'll not hear anyone in the video threaten Nikolai. Do not see anyone raising fist to him before it turns physical. You won't see anyone besides Nikolai with a weapon. You won't see the boys touch Nikolai until after stabbings start. The next portions of the still frames is moments before the witnesses say it turned physical when Nikolai punched Madison in the face, who was one of the women standing in front of him. The Carlsons say he punched Madison. The boys, the teenagers, say he punched the blonde girl. They didn't know her name, they didn't know each other. It happens fast. Remember, up to this point, Nikolai already has the knife in his hand. 
after it pans, from the last frames I showed you, AJ was walking over in the yellow swim trunks. The video pans back to the middle. You see Madison and Riley are standing in front of Nikolai. The video pans to the left. You see the boys still laughing. That's Isaac in the background of the middle photo. He's pretty much just standing there in the background. Then you see everybody react and you hear it. You hear the change in the tone. And this is when witnesses say Nikolai punched Madison in the face. You'll hear Madison testify and Nikolai punched her in the face. Madison's sunglasses are no longer on her head. We're here to testify that they got knocked off when he hit her. After Nikolai punches Madison, Dante, her friend, punches Nikolai. You can see that in the right frame. Again, Madison's sunglasses no longer there. Nikolai goes down in the water. You can see in the right photo, he gets slapped. Shallow water, his butt's in the water essentially. That's AJ in those photos pushing on Nikolai's back. You'll see that the push doesn't really do anything. Nikolai gets right up with the knife in his right hand, lunges at AJ as AJ's going to push him again. As AJ is pushing Nikolai, Nikolai stabs into his lower abdomen with the blade up and slices out his stomach. You can see in that right photo, he just missed his throat chin. In the middle photo, you can see AJ's stomach opened up on the bottom, right above the swim trunks. From the push from AJ, Nikolai goes down, lands in his butt in the water again. You won't see anyone in the video pounce on him at this point or approach him, try to hit him when he's down in the water. You see him try to grab at Tony. That's Tony. You'll hear that's Tony in the jean shorts. Tony walks by him. Tony has his back to Nikolai. And you'll hear Tony yelling in the video, get back, get back. You hear testimony from Tony that he thought he was breaking up a fist fight. So he's yelling at somebody off screen to get back. He has his back to Nikolai. Nikolai gets up, still with the knife in his hand. That person in the top left of the left photo is Riley. So after Tony, you hear him yelling directing somebody off screen to get back. He turns over, turns to Nikolai and he's yelling, get back, get back. And you see him pointing in the video and yelling. And you see Nikolai's hand going back with the knife in it. He makes a stabbing motion off screen. Tony's yelling at him, get back. And then you see Riley's just been stabbed. That group in the background there that Nikolai is facing with nobody between him and that group is his group. That's his group of tubers. Tony, you'll see and you hear from him when he testifies that he's just yelling at Nikolai to go. Nikolai doesn't. Again, that's his group. In the right photo, the guy with the aviators, that's his friend Ariel, almost up to Nikolai. Nikolai doesn't walk back to his group. Instead, he turns to Tony with the knife in his right hand. He stabs at him twice. You can see Riley bleeding in the background. Ariel, Nikolai's friend, is there as he's lunging the knife at Tony. That hand there on the bottom right hand corner, you'll see more clearly in the next still shots. Isaac, 
goes to shove Nikolai. See the gold bracelet. As he's shoving Nikolai, Nikolai lunges out with the knife. Nikolai kind of stumbles back from the push. Comes back with his knife covered in blood and dripping blood. He can see the women recoiling from him. Nikolai ends up by his friend Ariel as he's stumbling from the push. You don't see Dante get stabbed in the video, but I expect you'll see evidence and testimony that it was after this. It's not until this point in the video, after he stabbed AJ, Riley, Tony, and Isaac, that you hear people start to react and realize what's going on in the video. You hear that they all suddenly saw AJ, and you'll see in a second what they saw. But up until that point, people didn't realize that Nikolai was stabbing people. You'll hear in the video the shock and disbelief as what just happened. The camera pans around, you see Nikolai looking in the direction to where AJ and Isaac are. AJ is in the water, holding in his guts. Isaac's friends scatter and run. Juan, who's filming, runs back. Nikolai walks away. You can see at this point, if you recall the photo of Dante, he's got dark trunks on the bottom, light on top. He's got his hands on his torso and he's looking down. Nikolai continues to walk away. He walks by his friend Ariel. On that right photo, he's standing in front of Ernesto. He walks by Ernesto. On the right there, that's Alex Bing running to Isaac, who has collapsed in the water. You see AJ struggling. That's Nikolai by Ernesto. Nikolai continues walking. The camera pans away. When it pans back, Nikolai's off in the distance. Pans down a little bit. And that's what the middle photo is showing. And then you see in the right, sorry, in the left photo, you see he's approaching the right shore. Camera pans down, pans back up. He's walking away from the right shore. Isaac's group and the Carlson's group start helping each other, try to get to shore, get the victims to shore. Isaac and AJ who are collapsed. Nikolai starts walking back from the right over across to where his group is at the sandbar. Camera pans around the water. It's water's running red. It's Isaac's hat floating by. Nikolai is almost back to his group. You can see people trying to help AJ and Isaac. You see a couple people from the Carlson's group start to call 911. We hear from four people that were stabbed, and none of them saw Nikolai with the knife. They didn't notice he had a knife. They didn't know, they thought they were punched until they looked down and see all the blood. There's not gonna be any testimony on what Isaac saw. If he saw Tony get stabbed right in front of him when he went to shove Nikolai, because Isaac's not gonna be here to tell what he saw. You hear that some good Samaritans who are also tubing, some nurses, tended to AJ and Isaac until law enforcement and paramedics arrived. AJ, as a result, was disemboweled. He had to have emergency surgery. He was in the hospital for nearly a month and had to have numerous follow-up surgeries. Riley, who was in the bikini in the middle photo, was stabbed in the side. It sliced her diaphragm. She had to have emergency surgery.
Tony was stabbed twice. One, I'll describe how he kind of blocked it. He thought it was a punch coming in, so it just kind of scratched him. But the other one went into his torso. Isaac was stabbed in the chest and the torso, cut clean through two ribs, and sliced his heart. Died almost immediately. He was 17 years old. Dante was also stabbed in the torso. Nikolai returned to his group. You'll hear from people in his own group. He didn't really say what happened. He said, they took my knife. They stayed at the sandbar for a while, until a little while, sometime after law enforcement arrived. Multiple members of his group called 911. He did not. They reported they didn't know what happened, but multiple people were injured. One person from their group, Eric Von Williams, went over to help with the wounded. He also spoke with law enforcement when they got to the scene. He's the only one who did. At some point, Nikolai tells his group that they should just float to the exit. So they floated to the exit. You'll see that when law enforcement arrived on the scene, it was chaotic. Information they had was that an unknown subject stabbed five people. People didn't know where he was. They're all looking at AJ and Isaac and trying to help each other to shore and only paid attention to where the guy with the knife went. There's dozens of tubers that continue to go through. There's tubers running through the woods trying to find the guy who was stabbing people. Isaac and AJ there was no place to get to them by road. Officers had to go to the nearest. They went to the 35 bridge and then they had to wade upstream to get to them and float them out on tubes. <clears throat> You'll see that when officers get there, there's bystanders, just other tubers intermixed with victims, intermixed with witnesses. Some of the witnesses were so emotional they couldn't even say, articulate what happened at first. So, Juwan, who filmed the video, he alerts law enforcement that he's got a video of it. And he pauses it at an image of Nikolai from the video. And that office, that deputy, circulates it around to other law enforcement who are responding. Officers go down to the exit. One deputy walks right by Nikolai and his group because he's looking for somebody who matches that photo. And the reports all that they had where he was by himself. Deputy walks right by Nikolai, but then two citizens, one employee of River's Edge who had the photo and a friend of the owner of River's Edge alerted law enforcement that they think this guy matches the photo. Nikolai is apprehended. <coughs> Members of the group asked, why is he being detained? We have the wrong guy. This is how he was dressed when they law enforcement made contact with him. You'll see in the body cam, Nikolai doesn't really show any emotion when he's taken into custody. You'll see a video of Sheriff Knudsen when Nikolai is in the back of a squad car. Sheriff Knudsen goes to check on him. You know, how are you doing? You're doing all right. Nikolai says, what's going on? I hear somebody got stabbed. And I fit the description. Nikolai is later told by officers that he's under arrest for homicide and attempted homicide. Ultimately, Nikolai is interviewed by Lieutenant Randy Hart. That video, in that video you'll see the recording of that interview. His version varies drastically from the video of the incident. The interview is about 45 minutes long. 
we'll get to see that video, but I'll highlight some portions of it. When Nikolai is interviewed, he's not told there's a video. Lieutenant Hart shows him a screenshot, that one that went around the law enforcement. She asks if he knew that they took his picture. He says, no, he didn't know that. And then he asks if she has any other pictures of him. What other pictures did they give you of me? So up to this point, Nikolai told his group they should leave the scene of the stabbing. He put on the jacket, hat, and sunglasses. He tried to walk by law enforcement at the exit. He said to Sheriff Knutson, I heard somebody got stabbed, and he was told he was under arrest for homicide and attempted homicide. So you'll see in the video, Lieutenant Hart is explaining he doesn't need to speak with her. Nikolai responds, or I can say it was, uh, it was, it was self-defense, self-defense. There's lots of people uh, that came to me, self-defense, and they produced two weapons, one I took from them. And that's the only thing I tell you. They were, they hit me, they were on top of me. That's, I don't remember anything after that. I just remember I ran away. You'll see that Nikolai repeats over and over throughout the interview that they pulled knives on him. And because of that, he feared for his life. He also repeatedly says they knocked his goggles off his face. He says they're trying to pull his swim trunks down. And uh, they are uh, snorkeling, so they took my snorkel away. They threw it in the water. They grabbed my pants. One wanted to pull my pants down, and I grabbed onto them. And I don't know who that kid was, but he produced, he had a knife on, on him, and there was another knife, a longer knife, looked like a kitchen knife. They came, they grabbed my snorkel, and they threw it in the water. Those goggles are lost, they took them, they grabbed them off my face, and threw them in the water. Not only does Nikolai say repeatedly throughout the interview that they pulled knives on him, he says he did not have a knife. I feared for my life, there was the truth. And they started hitting me, pointing, pointing a knife at me, and another kid pointed a knife, and I thought that was it for me. So actually, I took it from, from one of the young kids, and I think that's when I swung back. When you watch the video, the only thing you'll see in other people's hands in that video are drinks, cell phones, and a big pet. You'll hear testimony from both Isaac's group and the Carlson's group that none of them had knives. He fly again, and one had it in his hand, so I took his hand and I bent it, I poked him with his own hand, and I took him from his hand and then I swung, so I don't know who I hit. I just know that I took the knife from, from one of those kids. Lieutenant Hart asks, um, did you have a knife with you? No, no, absolutely no. Nikolai says he's telling the truth, but he does not know where his knife was. He says I had, he says he had one earlier to cut the string for the tubes right at the beginning. I left it on the, I don't even know where at, what I did with it. I either gave it to one of the people or I put it in my truck. To tell you the truth, I don't even know. I don't even know uh, where it's at, to tell you the truth. Maybe one of the bags we had with it, with us, it may have been in, uh, I don't know, maybe I left it and put it back in the car. It really says he, everything happened fast, he doesn't know why they attacked him. I don't even know why they took my snorkel. I don't know why they wanted to pull my pants down, I don't know why they're being so mean. Why did they want to scare me with a knife? They're scaring people on the river. It's a family-oriented river with knives and what they did. I just grabbed the kid's knife. I didn't even know I was holding it right. I grabbed it from him because he tried to poke me with it. So I feared for my life. He says it over and over. They're pushing me, shoving, I tripped, I fell down. I got up and that's where I saw one of the kids there, the closest kid with the knife and I grabbed it from him.
Again, you'll hear he was already told he was under arrest for homicide. Nikolai asked Lieutenant Hart, so what happened? Can you tell me what happened? Lieutenant Hart says, yes, four people went to the hospital with injuries. Nikolai says, oh my God. Lieutenant Hart says, and one person died. And Nikolai says, oh no. Lieutenant Hart says, I don't know their names or their genders, I don't know. And Nikolai asks, is that because they fought each other? Again, you'll see this in the video of Nikolai walking off to the right shore before walking back to his group. You'll hear from Gilma Constanza, who was one of the tubers in his group, that as he walked back after the incident, he did not walk back directly to the group, he walked over to the shore across from them and threw something onto the bank. This is, a, you'll hear from Chuck Coleman from the Sheriff's Office. It's a 3D rendering, this is a bird's eye view of it. These are approximate locations. You'll hear on where things happened. The river in this image is flowing downstream, or down to the bottom. So the bridge would be below this image. <coughs> the, white ins the white dot is approximately where the boys were when Nikolai first made contact with them. They continued to drift down a little bit. The Carlson's group is that pink dot. They also continue to float down, so at the time of the incident, they were more kind of uh, parallel with Isaac's group. And then orange dot is the sandbar that you will see in the video where you hear that the, Nik the Nikolai's group was. That star, you'll hear that's where law enforcement found the knife. This is that knife that was found on the shore. You'll hear that this knife was sent to Wisconsin State Crime Lab, tested positive for blood. It was compared to DNA samples of the five people that were stabbed. It had DNA, Dante, and Isaac on it. By close to trial, you'll see that these were senseless and horrific acts of violence when all Nikolai had to do was walk away. At the close of trial, the state will ask you to find Nikolai being guilty of first degree intentional homicide of Isaac Schumann, attempted first degree intentional homicide of Riley Madison, AJ Martin, Dante Carlson, and Tony Carlson, <coughs> Battery of Madison Cohen. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, members of the jury, we are going to take a short recess. We'll come back at 2.10. Please take the jury out. All rise for the jury. You are watching live coverage of the Apple River stabbing trial. We just heard from St. Croix County District Attorney uh, Carl Anderson, who will be prosecuting Mr. Moo uh, on five primary counts, one of first degree intentional homicide, four counts of attempted first degree intentional homicide. We've got a recess for about 10 minutes. So right now we do want to bring in WCCO's legal analyst, uh, Joe Tamburino, a defense attorney who has, we should mention, no involvement uh, with this case directly. But Joe, tell me a little bit about what you thought of this opening statement and really analyzing this video piece by piece with some of these three and four image vignettes that we saw. I thought the opening statement was very good. It was very methodical. It went through step by step what the state intends to prove, and they have to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, one of the most telling things happened at the end of the opening statement, and that's where the prosecutor, Mr. Anderson, pointed out that as Mr. Mew was walking back toward his group, which was across the river, it looked like he was throwing something to the side uh, onto the shoreline, and then police wound up recovering the knife in question right in that area, and it tested positive with blood 
for two of the of the victims, Mr. Uh, or Dante and Isaac. Isaac is the decedent. That was the most one of the most powerful parts of the whole opening statement. And that we would hear from someone in Mr. Nikolai's group who saw him walking back over and didn't directly go up to the group at first. That's correct. I mean, you could see that one of Mr. Nikolai's friends, he had some sunglasses, was right there. What was perplexing about this whole thing is, according to these videos and still shots, it did not look like Mr. Nikolai was, sur Mr. Remu was surrounded. Yes, there was some altercation, there was a little bit of pushing, but it didn't look like he was surrounded. Not only that, but that was also brought up that they will have testimony that says at no time did Mr. Mew raise or brandish the knife or, in fact, say anything at all. That's correct. It seems like he kept the knife at his right side the whole time. I mean, I, I would imagine that if you were standing right in front of Mr. Mew, unless you were directly looking down toward his right thigh, you wouldn't see the knife. The other thing that was striking is when we saw those still photos, of how Mr. Mew was coming up with the knife. He was doing it in a very upward direction. It wasn't just a straight shot at the person, at the victim. It was going upward. And what does that tell you? That means the knife's going to go from the lower cavity of the body up, perhaps even under the rib cage, which is a very dangerous area uh, to have someone you know, be stuck with a knife. A lot was also made of uh, Mr. Mew's emotion at the time, or in many cases, a lack thereof. And they tried to obviously, through those photos, show that as well. Well, that's correct. In so many criminal cases, what happens after the fact is, is just as important as what happened during the incident. And there's two things in this case. One is the lack of an emotional response to all of this. Because obviously, if you had just stabbed someone, you would imagine that you'd be pretty emotional, whether it's because you're angry or extremely sad or distraught, there would be something there. The second is, what does the person do after the fact? Well, in this case, it appears, based on the videos that we've seen, that Mr. Mew simply just went about his business and went back to his group, and they continued to tube down the river. And then eventually, when the police saw him in that one location, he already had sunglasses on and put on some type of a jacket. It looked like a camouflage jacket. Yeah, and then there was those conversations with police, which made it seem as though he was not aware of, of what had happened in that incident. And then as the conversation continued, he said, oh, well, I didn't really realize I, I was acting in self-defense. They attacked me. And that's very good that you point that out, because some of the most uh, critical evidence uh, or could be damning evidence against a defendant is what did the defendant say when he was first questioned by police? Because one thing, out of all the years of my experience with jury trials, one thing that jurors really don't like to hear and see is a witness changing their story, especially a defendant. So, you know, if you have a situation where a defendant said A, B, and C, but then by the time trial comes around, they're saying X, Y, and Z, juries look upon that very skeptically because what they want to see is consistency. And obviously, Mr. Mew's statements to the police were not helpful to him. He denied having a knife that we can see. Obviously, in the videos, he had a knife. He said other people were stabbing at him, specifically two knives. We don't see that in the videos. When the police first came to him, he said, uh, it looks like somebody was stabbed and I fit the identification, meaning that he didn't have any part of this. So there's a lot of problems with his statement. And then also hearing from the four survivors that at no point did they even realize that he had a knife. They thought they had simply been punched. Correct. And that's probably because of a few things. One is everybody was drinking. I mean, there's no doubt about that. You could see that. Two is it's basically one big melee. People are coming in and coming out. But three, and probably the most important is he kept the knife way down on his right side. It wasn't like he was flashing it to everyone. He basically kept it lower. And, you know, it would have been obscured by his hand as well as, you know, his right thigh. And how much can we take from the fact that both Isaac Schumann's group and the Carlson group at various points said, go away, get away, go away, get away, and he in that situation chose not to, it appears, based on the video? Well, that's an excellent point. And that goes to the ability to withdraw from the altercation. 
You see, like in Minnesota, there's an actual duty to remove yourself from a situation before you use self-defense. In Wisconsin, there's no affirmative duty to that, but it's part of the calculation of reasonableness, meaning was it reasonable what the defendant did? So if somebody in Mr. Mew's situation really had a clear opportunity to get out, to get away from this, to stop the altercation, then reasonably he should have done so. Was there anything that you saw from District Attorney Carl Anderson that left you with lingering questions or things that, in, in your opinion, might not have been as clear as they could be and you would hope uh, would get clearer as time goes on? Yes, at the very beginning, uh, Mr. Anderson, the prosecutor, came out with those still photos that uh, that looks like Mr. Mew was literally running to the group of the young men and you could see the, the water splashing as he goes through it. But we needed a little bit more of an explanation as to what happened before that running. I mean, what was going on with Mr. Mew's group? I know there was some discussion about loss of a phone, but why did he target that specific group of young men? Because it appears that he just went right over to them. I would like to have heard more about that. How important is it for a jury before they watch this video, which we understand this all happens very quickly over the course of a few minutes, to get an understanding of, we, we saw it in the video and then also in that 3D imagery that we saw at the end, of the location of all of these different tubing groups? It's very important because when you have a situation, especially one that occurs outdoors, where you're in nature, you've got moving water, you've got trees and bushes, you're, you're basically out in the country. It really is important to give that jury some type of location to make sure they're oriented to say, look, from this position where we're seeing all these videos, here is the vantage point. But when, you, when a party moves down the river, here's where that location is on the map. Because you don't want to confuse the jury with too much chaos going on. You want to keep them centered and focused. And the best way to do that is to orient them to the location. Do you expect that Mr. Mew's defense attorneys will also have similar type images to try and obviously say that he was in a situation where he was just trying to defend himself? Yes, it's likely that they'll try to take some images to show all these young men either surrounding or getting close to Mr. Mew. Uh, the, the big thing to watch out for in this opening statement is how do they uh, explain Mr. Mew's inconsistent statements? How do they explain that at first he said, you know, you got the wrong guy and I don't know what was going on and then go to this is self-defense to what he's going to say on the stand? Also, Look for to see if the defense attorney actually tells the jury at this point that Mr. Mew will be testifying. And let's talk a little bit about the knife. Are, and are there any arguments that the defense is going to be able to push back against some of, of what we just heard? No, it's pretty clear, especially from that, you know, the still photos we just talked about where Mr. Mew is running across the river. And it's looking like he is running because you can see the splashing of the water around his his calf and his knee. Um, and you can see that with his right hand, he's either touching his the pocket of his shorts or it's like he's putting his finger in the pocket of his shorts. Something's going on there. So we're going to see how does the defense explain that? Are they going to admit that he always had a knife or are they going to have some argument that in fact he found a knife and picked it up or got it from somewhere? And I know obviously it's early on in this, but we got to know a little bit about Isaac Schumann. We saw his picture with his best friends um, and we learned that they called him bike. Obviously, as testimony goes on, we'll get a better understanding of who this 17-year-old young man was. Yes, it's, it's obviously a tragedy. It's very, very sad. Um, I think the prosecutor presented a very good picture of these young men and some young women of just having a good time on the Apple River. Uh, for anybody who knows the Apple River, it's a popular destination over the summer. Many people go there. They tube, they drink, they, they get a suntan. They have a lot of fun. Court still in recess for another moment or two. What are you going to be watching for from the defense here? How fast do they come out of the gate with their argument on self-defense? They've got to come out strong because right now, I think the prosecution gave enough of an argument to the jury to completely say, well, was this really self-defense? It doesn't look like anyone was really doing much harm to Mr. Mew. So the defense has to come out strong and quick 
to give that jury the impression that, look, Mr. Mew had his life in danger. He was being pushed in water. He could have drowned. There were all these young men on him. He's 54 years old. How is he going to fight all these guys? And one thing that would be difficult from the defense is if you're going to present people that were part of Mr. Mew's group, they were much further away from the video that we're seeing. That's correct. I mean, it's going to be difficult for anyone from his group to actually tell the jury what happened when he was with Isaac's group. But one thing, though, that's very important about Mr. Mew's group is the prosecutor will be able to get information about from them if Mr. Mew said anything to them. How did he act? Did he mention anything about the knife? Now, we know his wife has already given a statement to the police, and I'm sure that that's going to come out in trial. But his group's going to be important to, to give us information on post or what happened after the fact. And when we watch this video, do you feel like these jurors will be able to hone in on those individual moments that we saw? Or were there so many of them by the, by the time they see that full video, it might take a, a bit for them to recollect the conversation? I think they'll be able to completely digest this and be able to parse it out. And here's why. This is not the first time we're going to see these still photos and the video. This will be played throughout the trial. And they'll get evidence, meaning the video and the evidence, when they go into the jury room. So they'll have plenty of time throughout the trial and in their deliberations to parse all this information out. This is not the first time we're going to see it. Good. We are still waiting. We are in a brief recess right now there in St. Croix County. Uh, from, from a defense perspective, when, when you come out, like you said, come out swinging with that self-defense, what are you expecting, uh, you know, the prosecutor, or I should say the defense attorneys to say in order to really get the attention of these jurors? Acknowledge that this was a complete tragedy. Acknowledge that a life was taken that shouldn't have been taken, but then argue that your client had no choice because he was outnumbered on his back in the water. All right, Joe, it appears uh, things are ready to resume. We're going to go back now to the St. Croix <coughs> County District to, uh, to the courtroom, that is. Nick Mew standing in the river with 13 strangers. 13 drunk, angry strangers. 13 against one. They yelled and they screamed in order to attract a crowd. They got a crowd. They told lies to make the crowd angry. He's looking for little girls. He's looking for little girls. They layered their lies. They made them louder to make the crowd more angry. He's a predator. He's a predator. They chanted. They pulled on him. They closed the space around him. They got up in his face and they pushed him. Somebody else pushed him and they pointed and they pushed and they pushed and they pushed and when he put up his left hand when he put up his left hand to block and protect himself as they're in his space in his face he puts up his left hand to protect himself and then they got violent they got violent. They knocked a grown man, punched him, knocked him into the water. And when he's down in the water, they come up on him and they hit him again when he's down in the water. When he tries to get up out of the water, they attack him from the front, smack him across the front of the face while somebody else comes from behind and starts pushing him down. In that moment, he feared for his life. And he responded 
in self-defense. Let me show you what they did. Dante Carlson, who had earlier come over into that group, right? His dad had sent him over to help Nick. But the crowd got Dante going, and he was, it didn't matter. He was going to hit him. And when the opportunity arose, as Dante Carlson told you, will tell you, he laid him out. Knocks a grown man back off of his feet, where it's not just his butt. You'll see on the video, it's his shoulder, it's his head. He goes into the water. He didn't have a measuring stick. He wasn't figuring out what the height of the water is. He went in the water because they hit him into the water. And when he's down, you'll see, he's down in the water. And Dante Carlson, who punched him with his right hand, right? He was so confident. He was so confident. Had his beer in his left hand. And then he's given a beat down with his right hand. He then runs around him as, Don, as Nick is falling into the water. And he's in the water. He runs around him with the beer in his hand because he knows he's got his group around him. And then he comes around and he smacks him again. You can see in the first photo, you can see the shadow of Dante's arm coming across. And you can see it hits him across the face and across the ear. That's not just a slap. That's a full hand. You'll watch the video. It knocks him down. And then when he's down, he's down in the water, you'll see A.J. Carlson, who you'll hear tells you that he came over there to mediate. But for whatever reason, maybe it's because of a crowd, maybe it's because of a mob, maybe it's some other mentality. But when this happens, he sees this old man down on the ground. He doesn't go to help him. He goes to push him from behind. And while he's pushing him from behind, look in the upper corner there. That's Dante's arm. You can see in the middle slide, that's Dante's head, hand smacking Mew across the front of his head. And then you'll see on the third slide, that's where he's extending through. So confident he's going to beat this old man down that he keeps the drink in his hand. That's the close-up where you can see through there Dante Carlson hitting Nick Mew in the face while his friend attacks him from behind. You're going to need to make some choices in this case, right? Some, make some decisions. Some of the things that maybe that might help you to do. Let me just take a step right back, all right? Who is Nick Mew? Who's the man that they wanted to beat down on the river? We're going to tell you about that. How did he get there? What made him be in the river on that day, as we see, saw here earlier, who will tell you that story? And then lastly, why did this angry mob, this pack of players, why did they attack him? And we're going to tell you that. First, who is Nick, right? Nick's 54 years old, lives in Prior Lake. He's married, right? See a photo of You'll hear from his wife, Sandy, okay? She's going to be a witness. She was there with him that day. Him and a bunch of other 50-year-olds went to go have a peaceful day on the river, right? Nick grew up in Romania, right? And when he was about 15 or 16, he immigrated over here. We're not going to get really into it. Romania was not a good place to be in the 80s. Communist dictator. All kinds of other bad stuff was going on. And Nick's dad, like a lot of people in the world, wanted to have a better place for his family to grow up. So they, as political refugees, were accepted by a church in Minnesota, and they came over to Minnesota. When Nick was growing up, his first language was Romanian. Because he lived in this communist dictatorship, he also needed to learn Russian. Because he was in Europe, he also learned to speak French. 
And because he's this pretty, pretty smart guy, he also learned Latin. So when he was 15 and 16, he comes over to the United States, and then he picks up English as his fifth language. He can speak fluent English. He's fine. But I think it's important for you to know that's not his first language. When he, he graduates from high school in Minnesota, he decides he wants to go on and further his education, and he goes to school in South Dakota. He becomes a mechanical engineer, and he works. He's worked as a mechanical engineer for years and years. Bit of a handyman, as I imagine a lot of engineers are, right? I don't think of myself as a, as a handyman. He's a handyman, good with tools, hangs out with tools, and you'll hear from other people how he's used tools in the past. And you'll hear, that he, as you'll hear on the tape, as he tells the police, you know, living a peaceful, quiet life in Minnesota. Never been in trouble before. Him and some of his work friends, as all of us sometimes as adults, our circle of friends tends to be people that we work with. He has a group of friends, Amanda and Ernesto, They've been down the Apple River before. In fact, in fact, they've invited him before, and he's been down the river one time before, several, several years earlier. So they make a plan with all of those, the group of people that we saw, right? Oh, I forgot one thing here. Nick, like a lot of people, maybe as they get older, isn't of the best health. In 2020, he had a heart attack and he needed to have quadruple bypass open heart surgery. So these are the photos of him recovering from that. And it took him some time. And he'll tell you how that still makes him feel fragile, right? He doesn't feel as fit as he was when he was 18 or 22. So he decides to get out on the river with his friends. These are some of the friends. And as you'll see in photos, right? He's in the water that day. It's warm that day. Sometimes he's wearing his sunglasses. Sometimes he's not. Sometimes he's got a hat on. Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he has his shirt on. Sometimes he doesn't. This is the photo of the start, which is pretty much the exact same thing he was wearing at the end. Um, his friends Amanda and Ernesto uh, asked him to come along. There's a lot of other adults that are coming, right? There's none of these, there's no 20-somethings, no teenagers. They pack food and coolers. Sure, they have a couple of beers, but it's really just a time to get together with their other adults and float peacefully down the river. Nick. Nick likes to snorkel, right? So he brought his goggles and his snorkel, right? That's just kind of who Nick is. He's a bit of an explorer, a bit of a curious mind, and he'd brought his goggles and snorkel. And you'll see a video of him prior to this where he's just kind of laying in the Well, he kind of floats there with the goggles and the snorkel, and he's looking at the bottom of the water. Probably not a lot of exciting things at the bottom of the water in Apple River, but he was there to see it if there was something there. Before he leaves, he gets a call from his friend Ernesto, because Ernesto knows Nick and knows that Nick's a bit of a handyman and is like, hey, remember last time we had all those strings? We got all those strings, you gotta cut up stuff, you gotta do this. Can you bring that little pocket knife that you've got, that utility knife, I've seen you use it at my house. You've used it as a tool. Make sure you bring that, because we need to cut up some of the strings. So he does, gets, gets back, packs that up, brings it along. And sure enough, when they get there, they have uh, their provided strings. And the people you'll see, they tie up tubes, they tie up coolers, they tie up everything else. And he uses the, uh, his pocket knife to sometimes cut those up, right? You'll also see as he's going through on the river that day that his shoes kind of fall apart, right? And you'll see that pictures of his shoes, he's got strings, and he's tied them up, and he continues to cut with the little pocket knife that he has to make sure that his shoes, his footwear, are something that he can have. So they float down the river. All right, this is the group. You saw that photo already with uh, Mr. Anderson showed that to them, right? And again, here, here he has the hat on. Here he's got the hat off. Uh, you'll see later, not surprisingly, when he goes to snorkel, he doesn't have his sunglasses on. 
and sometimes when he snorkeled, he had a shirt on, other times he took it off. Here's another picture of him on the river with the group. Again, has the hat back on, depending upon what the sun is like. So, how did he get there, right? Well, as we talked about, Ariel, his friend, loses his phone, right? And whether they wanted to look for it or didn't want to look for it, I don't know how that's relevant. I don't know how his wanting to go help his friend look for his phone is any way important. You'll get to decide that. But we know at the end of the day is, it's uncontested, his friend lost his phone. And as you saw in some of those photos, they have these little bags that they put them on and they didn't know if it was gonna float or if it was gonna sink. But the water between him and the other two groups was downstream. So if something went into the water, it would float towards where those other two groups were. So Nick used his head and walked where he thought the, the, snor or the uh, phone was gonna float to, and he goes looking for it, right? And then while he's looking for it, he runs into another group, right? And this is the group that, that we're gonna talk about, two different groups, right? The first group he runs into is this group of high school, right? And you're gonna hear that they're drunk. You're gonna hear that they were smoking stuff. The one piece of evidence that we know for sure is that at the time of the autopsy, Isaac Schumann's blood alcohol concentration was 0.219. And if you ask his friends, his friends are gonna say he was the most sober one in the group. So we have this group, they're drunk, they're loud, there's six of them, they're football players, they've run as a pack together before, and you're gonna hear some videos, they're a quite confident group, right? And they see this man, this man that maybe others are gonna judge upon his appearance. This group of six see him and they start making judgments about him based upon what he looks like. He's an old man in the river with goggles and they don't like it. So they start calling him names, right? And there's a video, you're gonna hear it because they, they start harassing him. They start heckling him. They're basically trying to humiliate him. And Mr. Cockfield, one of the football players, he grabs his phone out and he thinks it's funny enough that he's gonna record it. And you'll see that recording just before this where he says, grown man looking for little girls. And he thinks it's really funny. And then he screams out, raper. He doesn't scream that out for his benefit of his five football friends that are with him. He screams it out to draw a crowd, get other people involved. Now, Mr. Mew may or may not have heard that exact thing, but he hears them yelling and he turns around and what does he see? He's looking for a phone, right? We know that. And when he turns around, he sees somebody holding up a phone. Maybe he's wrong, maybe he's mistaken about why they're holding up the phone, but he sees them holding up a phone, so he turns around to approach them, because he thinks that's the phone he's looking for. I'm looking for this phone, it floated down this way, these kids are yelling, and he starts jogging towards them. As you saw, as he jogs toward them, he's an unfit 260 pound man trying to move through the water, and he picks up his feet for about four steps, and then he reaches his hands out to grab their tubes, and when he does so, he puts the snorkel and the goggles in his mouth. Maybe they thought it was an act of aggression. I don't really think it was. You'll get to see it and watch it. But we know nothing happens after that. Because as soon as he goes and approaches, the goggles and the snorkel drop. He loses them and he immediately starts looking for them. That's about five seconds into the video. He starts looking for them and they start yelling at him, get away, get away, get away. So if this is the this is the tubes, right? You as the jury, you're looking downstream this way, right? Nick is standing here in front of the tubes. He looks, he comes up, and then he walks to the other side of their tubes. And he's now on this side of their tubes, downstream from them. He's downstream because that's where he thinks the goggles and the snorkels come. And did he tell the police officer that he thought they knocked the goggles and snorkels out of his hand? Yes, he did. Is that what he believed happened? Yes, it was. Is that what really happened? 
No, that's not what happened. And the great thing you're going to be able to see in this case is there's a video. There's a video that we can check everybody's testimony against. And you know what? Riley Madison got it wrong. Dante Carlson got it wrong. Madison Cohen got it wrong. Anthony Carlson got it wrong. Pretty much every witness, when you compare their human memory against the video, they got it wrong because we're humans. We can't get it as good as the video does. So he got that wrong, but he's still nevertheless looking for his goggles. His goggles are down in the water. He's looking for it, right? And he starts walking around there. There's nothing that prevents this group of football players who are screaming at him from just walking around. He's one man, maybe two feet wide. And you hear from there, they talk about him walking away, but they can just walk, just float on by, and leave this man alone. But they stayed a harass, they stayed a heckle, they stayed a humiliate. Because he starts walking away from them. And if you watch and you count, you watch it enough times, he takes about 10 steps away from them. And it's sometime during those 10 steps, it's sometime during those 10 steps when that group says, you got 10 seconds. 10 seconds. That's what this group of drunk teenagers says to that old man. And he's walking away at that point. And then what you'll see when the video comes back, he walked away and followed. They followed. They didn't go around. They went right up to him where he had walked away. Now remember, as he's walking in this direction, his group is 200 and some feet that way. 280 feet that way. This water is deeper. As he starts walking away, he gets into deeper water. He doesn't have his goggles, doesn't have his snorkel, still can't find the phone. He's getting farther away from this group. The drunken teenagers are yelling at him, and now they keep following him. Now, this video, all right, we're gonna show some slides from the video, and it's Super important, obviously. We're very thankful that we have it so that you will know exactly what happened. But what you gotta remember is the video was taken by Juwan Cockfield. It is from Juwan Cockfield's perspective. It's from his point of view, right? It makes it obvious. And so the person that we're watching oftentimes is Nick Mew, right? But you need to know, which is obvious, that the video is not from Nick's perspective. We're not watching it from Nick's perspective, we're watching it from somebody else's perspective. And why is that important? Because the judge is gonna tell you, right? It's important because at the end of the case, you'll need to determine the reasonableness of his beliefs from his point of view. You'll need to determine the reasonableness of his beliefs, beliefs, not actions, you're here to determine his beliefs and reasonableness from his point of view. So as you're watching that video, you're going to be asked at the end to be like, what would someone in Mew's position, from that standpoint, what would they feel? What would they believe? Let me just quickly read to this, right? If I can, the law of self-defense. In determining reasonableness, a belief may be reasonable even though mistaken. In determining whether Nick Mew's beliefs were reasonable, the standard is what a person of ordinary intelligence and prudence would have believed in Nick's position under the circumstances that existed at the time of the alleged offense. Not 30 seconds before, not a minute before, at the time of the alleged offense. The reasonableness of Nick's beliefs must be determined from the standpoint of Nick Mew at the time of his acts and not from the viewpoint of the jury now. And so I say that to you just so you know when we're looking at the evidence, what you're gonna be asked to do at the end. So they, right, they get him, they lift him into this position and this is 50 seconds into the video. He's walked 10 steps away, they come up to him and approach him and cut him off. So he walks away one time, they follow him. But Nick, 
right, sees, right, so he's here, he's got a group of people here, and he looks off to his left, and he sees a group of adults. There's two adults coming this way. Great, adults, not drunk teenagers. Adults are coming this way. He doesn't continue to engage with this. He gets and starts walking over here. He walks over to engage with the adults in the hope, as I think most of us do, when we see perhaps another adult and we're dealing with a group of drunk teenagers, maybe I can appeal to reason. These are adults. And when he walks over this way and the path down the river is wide open, those drunk teenagers follow him. Follow him over here where he then gets confronted by Madison Cohen. And Madison Cohen is not listening. She's not there for an appeal to reason. Her immediate words are to Nick Mew in his face, go get the fuck out, go. And you'll see Nick reaction is kind of like, as you heard from the, uh, look, my, they have my goggles, like, why are you in my face? What's going on? And you can see, they'll call it a smirk. They'll call it a smile. Look, there's 4,819 frames in that video. 4,819 frames. I have no doubt that you can pause on one of those 4,819 frames and find a photo where somebody's mouth is making a particular shape of anything at any time. Is he smirking? Is he smiling? You watch. You decide. Because he looks perplexed. He's immediately confronted, and he starts to give an explanation, and Dante Carlson tells him, it doesn't matter. Right? Appeal to reason? Nope. We're not doing that. That's kicked out the door. There is no appeal to reason at all. And while this is going on, the Carlson group, right, who sent two people over, also has Quentin Carlson. And he's an older duck. Madison Cohen, Dante Carlson, A.J. Martin, they're in their early 20s, which is fine. They're certainly adults, but that might be different than somebody in their 40s. Quentin Carlson, he sees what's going on, and what he says, I was worried about the group against one guy. I was worried that they were going to gang up on him and something bad was going to happen to the old guy. So I told my son Tony and Dante to go make sure they don't attack that old guy. That's not somebody looking at it from Nick's perspective, but that's somebody who can see maybe what Nick sees, hear what Nick hears, and his thought is, oh, something bad's gonna happen to that old guy. So he sends over his kids. And when they come over, right, the high school group continues in what I think we now know, it's a new term, is the gaslight of they just start making up lies in order to affect his perception of reality and everybody else's perception of reality. As soon as that group comes over, that high school group says, he's a predator. And then immediately they're like, he's looking for little girls, he's looking for little girls. There will be zero evidence that there were ever little girls even anywhere near on that river. Zero. There's going to be zero evidence that he was looking for the little girl. But they drum up, right? They get this crowd going. They've got the two people here, and they start yelling at. And then the crowd gets to be more, right? As this is going on, it's about 113, 115 into it, where they start screaming at him. He's looking for little girls. And then you'll see as he's standing here, after he's walked away from that group, he walks over to the adults. He's kind of pointing at them like, I got my snorkel. And they confront him. And as he's standing there, he turns his back on her and them. And he just stands here. And as he's standing with his back turned and the path down the river is wide open, instead of just walking on by, Madison Cohn decides she's going to put her hands on him. And she grabs him and starts pulling him pulling him and you'll see he turns around and immediately looks to his hand and says, don't touch me. Don't put your hands on me. They don't walk away. They stand right there. The crowd, the drunk high schoolers, continue to say he's looking for little girls. 
somebody says, is that what he said? And then it changes to the next lie is, we've got it on camera. We've got it on camera. You're going to see that they downloaded that phone. There ain't nothing like that on the camera. There ain't nothing like that on the camera because that's not what happened. Because these drunk teenagers were gaslighting him and they're enticing a crowd. Nick stands there. He's now got people all around him, right? They're chanting at him. He's a predator. He's a predator. He's all alone. He's getting, it's getting louder. He raises his left hand to his group. Like, we need some help here. Like, something's going on, right? And when that happens, you'll see the camera. Juwan Cohen turns the camera to show where he's waving to. So the high school group has knowledge that Nick Mew, who's standing right here, doesn't want to go that way. Nick Mew, who's blocked right here, wants to go that way. Because that's where his group is, because that's where everybody looks. And you'll see on the camera, Madison Cohen, as she stands and he waves, she turns and looks and sees he's got some friends. So does Madison Cohen say, yeah, why don't you just go that way? She doesn't. What she does is she reaches to her friends and says, hey, get over here. She calls in more numbers. She calls in more numbers to confront him. Because at that point, it was eight against one, and she wanted more. So she brought over Riley. She brought over Janelle. She brought over Gabby. And then she calls for Anthony. And then she calls for AJ. And then it's those 13 people that surround him, right? And they're standing there, and you're going to see they're all around him. They are <laughs> relentless in what they're yelling and screaming. From his standpoint, this is like, what is happening? What world did I just step into in which there's this group of drunk kids, drunk teenagers, who, they want to say kids, I get it, but you saw those pictures, they're all bigger than Nick. Nick's smaller than he was then, right? But he hasn't grown any, he's just shrunk more, right? But he's not a big, fit guy, right? They're screaming, they're chanting, right? And at that point, yes, Nick, outnumbered 13 to 1, reaches in his pocket, finds his pocket knife, opens it up, and stands there with it. He doesn't brandish it, no, but he doesn't hide it. He's standing there with it. His belief at that point is, I don't want to use this. I don't think showing it to him is going to help. But if something happens, I need to, I don't know what's going to happen. So he's standing there with the knife. And as he's standing there with the knife, Riley Madison is right in front of him. And she pushes on him. You'll see that in the video. And then next to her, who's blocking him from his people, is Madison Cohn. She takes her right hand and she pushes his left shoulder. And he has to go back. She pushes him back. And while all this is going on, the group of drunk teenagers are screaming, chanting, yelling. The numbers are getting bigger. They come over towards him. All right? They push him again. They block his path. And this is the, the same. That's what it looks like. You're me. You're looking upriver to see where your safety is. Behind you is deeper water. You've walked in that direction before. He's followed. You appealed to reason, and they said it doesn't matter. They're up in his face, right? And Madison Cohen's pushing and pointing at him, right? And Mew's standing there. He's got the knife in his right hand. He doesn't use the knife. He's standing there while they're pushing and pointing at him, right? And when he does that, all of a sudden, that's when Dante Carlson gets violent, right? He's predisposed for violence, I submit to you. That's the entire purpose of the gaslighting, of getting the crowd there, of yelling with the crowd, of getting it all jacked up, is Jawan Cohen. Wanted to record a viral video in which some old man was getting beat down and he was going to get it on tape. He created that world. He put him in that world. I object a lot of this is argument, not summarizing. State, please focus on what you anticipate the evidence will show. That's what the evidence is going to show, right? 
Dante Carlson has told you before, and he'll say, it doesn't matter, right? At that moment, that's when, Matt, or, that's when Nick Mew raises his left hand to protect himself. He's raised it before to call for help. I think I missed it. He raised another time to call for help a second time, and now they're crowded around him in his face. He raises his hand to protect it, and that's when they get violent, right? It's a push, not a punch. It's a push to protect himself, not a punch. The evidence, you'll watch that video. You might watch it 20 times. It's not on the video. There's no punch on the video. She's standing there yelling, and when she's standing there yelling, there are two people between her and Nick Mew. He's got the knife in his right hand, right? It's not on the video. There's no physical evidence. She says he punches her with his right hand. He's got the knife in his right hand. There's not a mark on her. You're gonna see from John Schultz, his video, he spoke with her right then. He's right in her face. He's got a body cam. You'll get to see the body cam of her face. And she, not a blemish on it, not a mark on it. Doesn't support that he punched her. Third thing, multiple evolving stories. Listen to what the witnesses say. Who really says is there a punch and what position were they in to say it? Because here's what they said before. Quentin Carlson, he told the police, she said he was punched. She said she, he punched her, but they said it was a slap. So everybody else initially said it was a slap. Gabby, one of the witnesses, says he smacked her with his left hand. She's consistent with he raised his left hand. Uh, Mr. V Alexander Vang, one of the high school kids, says he hit her with an open hand with his left hand. AJ... He says he saw him pull her hair, which nobody's gonna say. That's just wrong. Nobody's gonna say anything along those lines. Dante, the person who laid him out after he said that, spoke with the police, and initially what he said to the police is he saw, I saw Mew make a swift motion to Riley Madison. Then he says, I saw Mew make a motion towards Riley Madison. Then he says, I saw Mew make a swift motion to Riley Madison. Then he says a fourth time, swift motion, Riley Madison. I don't know what he's going to say when he comes up there now, but what he said before isn't a punch, and it wasn't to Madison Cohen. That's when the violence begins, right? They attract the crowd. They moved in closer. Now, one of the things you're going to want to ask, and we will ask that, is when this happens, this group of 13 is around, and the old man gets knocked, and he's down in the ground. Listen to the video. Is there anybody in the group that says, whoa, this is out of hand? No. You'll hear when he gets knocked on the ground, the volume goes up. The cackling and the laughing goes up. And the videographer pushes people away to get in closer to document the beatdown as well as he can. This isn't somebody that's just taking a video on the side. And then again, we move around. Dante Carlson is confident enough to still have the beer in his hand while this happens. Mew's response is in self-defense, right? People come at him, and he makes a quick, short jab motion. He believes he has to use the knife because he's outnumbered. A.J. Martin wants. Riley Madison wants. Dante Carlson, twice, but he only has two stitches. Isaac Schumann wants. Dante Carlson wants. When they come at him, he gives a quick jab. They back up. He doesn't lunge for them. He doesn't follow them. He doesn't recklessly swing it around. They come at him, 
after they gave him a beat down and he jabs up. When even Brandy Hart, I think you're gonna hear from her, right? When Mr. Troff, he asked her questions. When people attacked you, he responded. She agrees with that. So what happens is pretty much all on video, right? At the end, the judge is going to read you that jury instruction similar to what he did about credibility. And how much of credibility is going to play a part in this trial is going to be up to you. You guys are the finders of the fact. You decide what happened. But I'd submit to you, it's all on video. Pretty much know what happened because it's on video. Right? So, we can talk about credibility. Nick spoke with the police, right? He told them he was afraid. He told them he feared for his life. He told them he was acting in self-defense. He also told them, I don't really remember anything. And he lied to the police about the knife. He did. He lied about the knife. It was his knife. He brought it. He was outnumbered. He believed he needed to use it. The truth is, he used it because he was surrounded by that angry mob and he was afraid, right? They gave him every reason to be afraid. When their attacks stopped, he walked away. When they stopped, kept coming at him and every one of them coming at him, right? He responded like a victim of trauma response. You'll hear from witnesses in his group who will say he looked like he was in shock. He was white as a ghost. From his perspective, right, he had just been attacked by an angry mob who was trying to kill him, and he, he, got, his way, he got out of there. So as he walks back, he still has fear, right? It's not something that just goes away. That fear is deep inside of him at that point. And as he walks away, he wants nothing to do with the group that just attacked him. He wants nothing to do with the knife and he tosses it up onto the shore. Maybe not the best decision, maybe not how he should have responded, but he was suffering from serious shock and trauma at that time. That's what he did. It's not gonna be a contested fact. He looks back to his group, right? And they'll say that he's wide-eyed, he's white as a ghost. Um, Remember, he'd just been repeatedly hit in the head, pushed down into the water. His body continued to respond in that way. When he walked away, he knew he'd done some quick jab motions. He didn't know the extent of anyone's injuries. Did he hear them yelling? Sure, they'd been yelling for two minutes, screaming and yelling at him. He had been in trauma at that point. He didn't know what the yelling was about. He didn't know that anyone had died. Maybe he should have. Okay, fair enough. But in that situation, would you expect him who just been attacked and responded in just short, quick jab motions to know the extent of everyone's injuries? They go back and everyone's like waiting, waiting, waiting. Traffic on the river pretty much shuts down and they wait there. When the police come by and kind of basically move everybody along, his group, moves along to the exit. He's got his hat and his sunglasses and his shirt on, just like he did at the start of the trip. All right? He's been in shock. They'll tell you he was cold. So there's really, these are the three things that you need to think about, right? One, what happened? Don't think it's gonna be a big mystery. It's on video. And I hope that that's helpful to you. Because the facts, I don't think, are going to be very contested. Two, you are going to be asked, what did Nick believe? Right? He told the police, and he'll tell you. He feared for his life. In that moment, against that group who were violent with him and knocked him down, he feared for his life. Right? The video evidence supports this, right? 
I'd ask you rhetorically, what other reason is there? What other reason could there be? They came at him. He, he was in fear. He responded. The last question. Were his beliefs reasonable? I don't want to get belabor the point about the law. Right? I can't find it right away. But it's from his viewpoint, right? It's from his standpoint. The belief may be reasonable, even though mistaken. When determining whether Nick Mew's beliefs were reasonable, the standard is what a person of ordinary intelligence and prudence would have believed in Nick Mew's position under the circumstances that existed at the time of the alleged offense. So what do we know that might help you to decide that, right? We know he walked away and they followed. We know he tried explaining to them and they said, it doesn't matter. We know they told lies about him to incite the crowd. We know he knows that those were lies and he was watching as this crowd gets louder and more intense and bigger. We know they cut him off from where he wanted to go back up to his wife and his friends. We know that somebody else that was watching who is kind of like Nick, a little bit younger, about the same fitness level though. And when that person, Quentin Carlson, sees what's going on, his first thought is, there's something bad that's gonna happen to that old guy. We know he was surrounded, we know he was outnumbered, and we know that this environment was right for violence. That's the violence, that's the environment they carry. And we know that Nick, is fragile. He believed he was fragile. This is somebody who went through open heart surgery within a couple of years. He didn't have fitness. They attacked him, kept attacking him, and they gave him every reason to believe they weren't going to stop. Were his beliefs reasonable? This is Isaac Schumann. I'm sure he is a wonderful man, wonderful human being. And we're gonna hear a lot about him. But in this moment, on this day, on that river, when he was drunk, he tried to strangle Nick. His hands were on his throat. He was pushing up against Nick Mew. And Nick reaches out as he's falling back. That is what Nick did. His belief at the time, when he's being strangled after being constantly attacked, was he needed to get out there. And the only way that he could do that was with his knife. He believed his life was in danger. And we submit to you under those circumstances, that's reasonable. the end of the trial, we're going to come back up here, right? Okay? We'll be back up here, and we're going to ask you to return a verdict of not guilty on all counts. The judge will tell you on that last day. He'll tell you the law. If you can reconcile the evidence, on any reasonable hypotheses consistent with Nick's innocence, you must return a verdict not guilty. Okay, just one more time. The judge will tell you if you can reconcile the evidence on any reasonable hypotheses consistent with Nick's innocence, you must do so. We must return a verdict.
only reasonable hypothesis in this case is he feared for his life. And that belief was not unreasonable. They created that world to get that environment. In that world, he believed it in that moment. And that's reasonable, because anyone in that situation would believe the same. So at the end, we'll ask you to do your duty. In a moment, we will hear from the state's first witness, uh, members of the jury, members of the gallery. If you want to st stand and stretch, you may. We are not going to take a recess. I'll give the attorneys a moment or two to reorganize their tables. Yeah. Yeah, just push it up against the... Oh, yes. Uh, can somebody move the um, easel out of the way? All right, is everyone ready? All right, members of the jury, we are going to start the evidence. Uh, if you would like to take notes, you may take out your notepads. Uh, please don't allow the note-taking to distract you from carefully listening to the evidence, however. Mr. Anderson, who is the first witness? Okay. State uh, calls Stephen Kaufman. Can you spell the last name? K-A-U-F-M-A-N. Hey, uh, Mr. Kaufman, please come forward. And stop right there, face the clerk, raise your right hand, she will administer the oath. Please have a seat in the witness chair. Mr. Anderson. Can you please state your first and last name for the record? Stephen Kaufman. And how do you spell your last name? K-A-U-F-M-A-N. And um, do you usually go by Steve or Stephen? Steve. Steve, what do you do for a living? I'm the owner of River's Edge Campground. What is River's Edge? River's Edge is a campground and, and tubing, you know, wedding reception facility. Okay. And where is it at? Uh, the exact address? No, just is it in uh, Somerset, the township? Uh, we're in New Richmond. Okay. And um, permission to approach? Yes. I'm handing it. It's been marked as exhibit 25. Does that appear to be a map of the route tubers take from your campground? Yes. And permission to publish, Judge? Okay. Any objection? Objection. All right, you may. Move to admit also. Any okay. objection? No. 25 is received. Just have a look. So the, the arrow on the top right, is that where your campground is located? That is correct. And is that about where it's pointing where campers, or I mean tubers, sorry, enter the river? Just, it'd be just to the right or upstream of that arrow. So the arrow would point about where um, our bridge is. And so just to the right more in this map, it, it shows a little island there. It'd be right next to that island. Okay. 
Do I, do I actually just come circling on here? Okay, thank you. And, uh, you see the arrow marking hideaway? What's that? Uh, that is another campground and tubing facility. Is that a common place where tubers will stop if they leave from your place? Yes. And is there, what's there for, like, why do tubers kind of stop there? Is there a beach bar? Um, they have a bar there, yes. Okay. And then uh, is the exit where tubers get off of the river identified on that map? It is. And is it about where that arrow is, a little off? Um, oh, that's about correct. Okay. And that, you see where that arrow is that says incident location? Yes. Are you familiar with that location of the river also? I am. And does that bridge, that 35 bridge, have another name that people call it? Mm, not that I'm aware of. Have you heard it referred to as the Sunrise Bridge or no? I have. Because there's a, well, there's a campground that used to be called Sunrise Park, and okay. so um, that's why they call it that. All right. And um, and then the, the exit is the Village Park exit? Correct. This whole river route... Is that in St. Croix County, Wisconsin? It is. If you know, how many tubers about would you get on a typical nice weather Saturday in the summer back in 2022? River's Edge that day we had approximately 12 to 1,500. Oh, on, on July 30th, 2022? Um, that particular day, I thought your question was on a nice oh. weather Saturday. Okay. But I don't know the exact number for that day, but I, I'm believing it was in the thousand range. Okay. And when they, when tubers rent, do they rent tubes from you? They do. And do you norm, do you, would you normally see families, is it known to be kind of a party scene, family scene, mix? A little mixed. Okay. River's Edge really strives for the, to get as many families as possible, but yeah, you get mixed. Okay. And um, do, when groups tube together, they, do they often tie their tubes together? Correct. Do you guys sell pre-cut string for tubers to do that? We do. And you did back in July of 22 also? Correct. About how long does it take to tube from the start to the exit? It takes about two to two and a half hours on a normal day. Of course, that can fluctuate with river levels and the speed of the water. Um, and that would be without stopping. Okay. So it depends on how fast the current is. Correct. And then it depends on how long and how often people stop? Correct. And uh, do you happen to know about how long it takes to tube from the 35 bridge to the exit? It's about 30 minutes. Okay. And how about from the hideaway bar to the 35 bridge? We have similar time. As you can okay. see on the map, it's about similar distance as well. So I'd say 30 to 45 minutes for both of those. And were you working on July 30th, 2022? Yes, I was. And at some point, did you get word of an incident on the river? I did. Do you remember what you were doing? I was uh, on my way to the exit just to check on my staff and check on, um, you know, we uh, collect the tubes from the tubers and just do a normal check-in. And um, Mike Cappers 
happened to be there at his bus stop and and told me about it. And so you guys, for both, and Mike Cappers is the old owner of Hideaway? Correct. And so you guys would both, tubers would go down through the river, either through your place or through the Hideaway, and then both, all of you would pick up at the Village Park? Correct. And you have buses going back and forth? Yes. And... Um, Where did you go then, once you heard about it? I went to where he told me the, the incident had happened, and so I was on my little moped scooter, and I drove to the incident. What was the scene like when you got there? Uh, there a large police presence and an ambulance, and... Um, Calm, orderly, chaotic? Um, I wouldn't say it was chaotic. Um, people were moving at a rapid speed, but it was, it was, seemed organized. Did, were tubers still coming through? Um, no, we had directed everyone to get off at the hideaway location at that. By the time I got there, we had already had people uh, directing people off of the river. And is that something law enforcement asked you to do, or did you just figure you should, if you remember? Um, I think it was a little of both. Okay. And at some point, um, did you get a description of the person who had stabbed people? Um, I did. Um, when I got to the scene, um, I um, ran into a, a, a couple who I assumed were husband and wife and asked them what, what happened, what was going on. <laughs> and they said they were tubing with their children, a little upstream from them. They heard some uh, shouting, and by the time they got there, this had happened, and they don't know exactly what had happened. There was a gentleman that they said was, you know, middle-aged man that, that left the scene. At some point, did you get a photo of the person who was alleged to have been done the stabbings that was going around? I did then, so maybe 15 to so minutes, 10 minutes later, then um, Mr. Cappers texted me a photo that had I don't know where he got it from or how he got it, but said this is a, this, a picture of the person. Did you forward that photo on to um, your staff? I did, yes. And did you also have a friend with you that day? Um, I did. I was, he wasn't with me, but um, he was at this uh, location when I got there. So we what were, was his name? Carl Schilling. And then did you either give or show him a photo, the photo? At uh, that time, no. Did you tell Because we didn't have it yet. I'd left, okay. I'd left before I got the photo. Did you send it to him at some point, if you remember? I don't remember. OK. You might have, you might not have. Anyway, you're right. Your friend's name was Carl Schilling, the one that was in the area? Yes. Okay. Are you aware that whether Carl or a staff member later alerted law enforcement to somebody matching the description at the Village Park exit? I am. Was that Carl and one of your employees? Uh, correct. And, and I should have clarified. Carl and an employee, two different people. Correct. Because Carl's a friend, not an employee. Yes. Okay.
Do you guys, um, I forgot to ask this before, do you rent tubes for just people and also for like cooler tubes? We do um, rent a, a cooler tube, it's just another tube with a, a basket or a space for people to float. Okay. I don't have anything else. Um, and you would agree that there, there are certain responsibilities to do certain things in a particular lane, right? Sure, yes. Um, the river, there's no designated lanes, are there? No. Um, sometimes it, everyone's going in the same direction, hopefully. Correct. But uh, as far as lanes and designated spaces, it's a bit of a free-for-all, right? It is a natural river, and... And the water space, is take you. Um, the water will guide you where you need to go. Sure. But the people that are on the river and have the ability to move amongst themselves on the river, they're free to go wherever they want on the river, right? Yes. And um, sometimes there might be some groups that are more dominant than other groups on the river, right? That happens? Um, Checked on relevance and speculation. There's a stain on form. It's vague. Can you be more specific? Sure. Are there, you rent tubes to lots of different groups, right? We do. Uh, you, as you said, uh, some are uh, perhaps younger teenagers, young adults. Yes? From six to 106, yes. Yep. And some are uh, grown adults in their 40s or 50s, correct? Of course. Sometimes you rent to a group of two people, right? Yes. Sometimes you rent to a group of six people. Correct. Or ten people. Yes. Um, and it all depends upon, there's, so there's different sizes of different groups, correct? Yes, sir. And in your experience have sometimes there have been some groups that have been larger and lou louder than other groups? Sure. <laughs> um, and sometimes there's other groups that might be quieter than other groups, right? Sure. Maybe, depending on the group that you're at, you might have different goals or objectives for the day, correct? Correct. I'm sure, again, I mean, you're not encouraging, but you're aware that there might be some groups that their goal and objective is to go there and get drunk, right? Sure. You're aware of that, right? I am. And then there might be other people that are just there to enjoy a peaceful day with their friends, right? Yes. And sometimes these groups interact, correct? Correct. Um, you would agree that the larger and the louder groups don't have any more right to be in a particular place than the quiet groups, do they? No. Um, do you give any messages that to the renters of your tubes to say, like, look, if you see a loud and uh, a large loud group, you need to back away and give them distance right away? No. Somebody, individuals have the right to be there just as much as everybody else, right? Correct. <clears throat> so on the river, it is simple as does might make right? If you're just larger and louder, you get a right to that spot or not? I wouldn't think so, no. Yeah. 
Those are the only questions. Thank you. Mr. Anderson, do you have anything else? Since we're asking hypotheticals, I guess. If so, nobody owns any of the river, it's public. Correct. You, you also wouldn't want somebody harassing another group of tubers? No. Nothing else. Mr. Nelson? No, thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Kaufman. You're free to leave. Is he still under subpoena? Yes, sorry, I was, yes. He's free to leave. Yes. yes. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Judge, this is just a blown up version. Do you want me to just write 13 on it or put a separate st sticker on it? So just, the eight by 11 is 25? Or 25, I'm sorry, yes. Make, mark the blow up as 25A. We can take care of that, <clears throat> perhaps later. All right, who is the next witness? Uh, the state calls Ryan Nelson. Uh, Mr. Nelson, please come forward. Stop right there. Pick <laughs> okay. a little closer. Uh, turn, face the clerk, raise your right hand. She will administer the oath. Please have a seat in the witness chair. Judge, before we begin, we have an agreement on a couple exhibits. Okay, what's the agreement? The agreement is that exhibit two, the video that of the the main video would be admitted as well as the individual frames, which is marked exhibit three. Is that correct, Mr. Trofasi? Yes. All right, so exhibit two and three will be received. And then um, we have an agreement that now, before we start taking testimony, we'll publish exhibit two of the video. You're going to play the video? Yes. All right. Uh, members of the jury, you're about to see the video that they have been referring to. Um, please uh, pay attention. Please listen carefully. Parts of it may be difficult to hear. Uh, the video that you're about to see is evidence, so you may consider this along with the other evidence during this trial. Stringer, can we just mess a little bit? Yeah, we've just turned down uh, a bank or two over the monitor. Space. Okay. Okay. Nothing happened. It's up. Did the lights go down? No. Uh, they did over there, maybe. Oh, no. Try a different bank. How's that? Is that okay? Did everybody see? Okay. I think that'll that'll do it. Oh, 
Who is that? Who the hell is this? Go, get it up, go. It doesn't matter. Go, go, go. Go, go. He said he was looking for a little girl. He said he was looking for a little girl. You're looking for a little girl? Yeah. That's exactly what he said. We're the best out. I didn't even have that part on camera. Did I? Some young ass kid. What the hell is this guy's problem, bro? This guy's looking for a little girl. We're trying to have fun. He's going to call you. He's going to take you. We're in the one in the one. We're Or Mr. Smith's dead. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Can you say your name for the record, please? Ryan Nelson. And how old are you, Ryan? 18. Uh, what do you do for a living? Uh, I work in the trades. Um, are you a drywall installer or something? Yeah, the drywall finisher. Um, where do you live? Uh, Stillwater. Were you familiar with a person named Isaac Schumann? Yes. How did you know him? Uh, he was one of my best friends. How long uh, were you best friends with Isaac? Uh, since middle school. Uh, do you recall uh, the day of July 30th of 2022? Yes. Were you with Isaac on that day? Yes. Were you with him when he was killed? Yes. How old were you back on uh, July 30th of 2022? 17. Had you finished high school yet? No. What grade were you in? Uh, Some are going into senior year. Um, on July 30th of 2022, had you made some plans to uh, spend time with your friends that day on the Apple River and near Somerset? Yes. Um, what was the plan? How did the day start? Um, well, we texted the night before and made plans to meet up and I'll go tubing on the Apple River. Where did you meet up at? Uh, Stillwater High School. Um, who was in your group that day? Uh, me, Isaac, Owen, Jawan, Landon, Alex. So do I can approach the witness? Yes. All right, I'm gonna show you what's been marked as Exhibit 62. You recognize that? Yes. Can you tell us what it is? Um, it's a picture of every, all my friends over there. Uh, fair to say it's a composite picture? Yes. Are those pictures of you folks from the river on July 30th of 2022? Yes. <clears throat> Are those photos from after the incident with Mr. Mew? Yes. Does that explain the looks on your faces? Yes. Your Honor, permission to publish to the jury. I have a blow-up. Any objection to 62? 
No. All right, 62 is received. Go ahead and publish. The other side might be easier because it doesn't have the paper. Uh, when you got to Stillwater High School that day, was the plan to all ride together over to the Apple River? Yes. Who drove? Uh, Alex Hang. I'm going to have you look at Exhibit 62 there uh, that you're holding on to. Can you identify the folks in the picture for the jury? Um, from, left to, from left to right. Alex Vang, Juwan Cockfield, Owen Pelequin, uh, me, Ryan Nelson, Landon Wire, and then Isaac Schumann. That's Isaac in the, the hat on the right? Yes. Is that what you uh, were all wearing on the river that day? Yes. You may have already answered this, but who drove from Stillwater over to the Apple River? Uh, Alex Vang. Uh, and you all went in his vehicle? Yep. Uh, where did you go first? Um, um, we went right up to park where we got the tubes. Uh, River's Edge, I think it's called. Uh, you rented tubes there? Yeah. You remember how many tubes you rented? Um, one for each of us and then one more for our stuff, I believe. All right. Um, when they give you the tubes, are they connected together or do you connect them together there? Uh, you had to get a, a wire, like a twine to connect them together. Did you do that? Yes. Did you make sort of one big raft out of your tubes? Yes. <clears throat> um, after you rented the tubes, did you get on the river right away or were you hanging out in the park? Uh, no, we went right straight to the river. All right. Do you know what time it was when you got on the river? Uh, not exactly. Probably roughly around noon. Um, Judge, if I can approach the witness again. Yes. Do you remember who paid for them? Uh, no. All right. Um, do you remember getting a receipt? Uh, no, I don't. All right. Let's show you that's marked as exhibit 27B. You take a look at that. And specifically look at the back side. Whose name's at the top? Uh, Alex Vang. Uh, who's, who's that? Uh, he's one of my friends. He's on the river. All right. Um, at the bottom, there's a time for when you rented your tubes. Can you tell us what that is? Uh, 1239. You didn't see this that day at all? No, I don't remember. <clears throat> Your Honor, I'll move to admit that exhibit. I don't know if there's any objection to it. Any objection? Well, there's no foundation, Judge. Sustained. We'll, we'll wait till. That's fine. Thank you. <clears throat> Once you got on the river, uh, did you folks bring drinks with you? Uh, yes. And a cooler of some sort? Yes. Um, what were you drinking? Um, beers and seltzers. All right. Uh, you're 17 at the time? Yes. Um, do you remember how many beers you had? Um, I personally had about three to four. Um, or you or other folks in your group um, smoking marijuana? Yes. <clears throat> Was Isaac Schumann smoking any marijuana? Um, I don't think so, no. Um, as you're going down the river, did you eventually have contact with the defendant, Mr. Mew? Yes. Do you know where it was when you first saw him? Um, where the incident happened. Sure. Were you near any landmarks that you can remember? Uh, a bridge. Uh, what was he doing when you first approached him? Um, well, he first approached us. He was snorkeling. 
fire tubes. Did he... Did you ask him what he was doing? Uh, yes, multiple times. And what did he tell you? Uh, he didn't say anything. Did he ever tell you he was looking for a phone? No. Do you remember, ever remember hearing him saying anything about looking for little girls? Uh, no, not me personally. All right. Um, ultimately, did you approach your group? Yes. You were here um, when we played the video in the court right before your testimony? Yes. Um, the first part of that video, uh, did you see Mr. Mew running up towards your group? Yes. Um, is that the legs of a couple of your friends in that video, the first few seconds of that video? Yes. That's that's your raft of tubes? Yes. Um, as Mr. Mew is running up uh, on your group, did he say anything about why he was running towards you? No. Did he say why he was grabbing onto your tubes? No. Um, were you able to see on the video that he was reaching towards where the legs were of the two people and the tubes that you can see in the video? Yes. Um, did he make physical contact with those folks? Um, he didn't make physical contact with me, so I know. Did everybody bail out of their tubes once he ran up? Yes. <clears throat> did you have some concern uh, when you saw him running up and grabbing onto your tubes? Yeah, a lot. Did he say anything at all after he grabbed onto your tubes? No. Uh, were you sitting or standing uh, in your tube when he ran up? Uh, sitting. Did you get up? Yes. Why? Uh, I was scared. Did you want to, were you trying to get away from him? Yes. <clears throat> Did you say anything to him? Uh, yes, we asked him what he was doing and we told him to leave multiple times. All right. Uh, fair to say you were raising your voice and yelling at him? Yeah. Like we saw in the video? Mm. Uh, did you threaten him in any fashion? No, not at all. Did you hear Isaac Schumann um, threaten Mr. Mew in any fashion? No. Did you yourself have any kind of knife? No. Did you see anybody in your group with any kind of knife? No. Is it fair to say you were calling him some names? Yeah. Why were you doing that? Um, we had no idea of his intentions, and we asked him, and he never, ever stated them. At some point, were you yelling uh, for him to get away? Yes. Did uh, another group on the river come over to investigate what was going on? Yes. Did you know any of those people? No. Did you see where they came from? Uh, just the other side of the river. Right. Were they adults or were they kids? Uh, young adults. Older than your group? Yeah. Once this other group came over, uh, was it women or men, if you remember? Um, I believe two girls uh, approached first. All right. And what did they do when they approached? Uh, also told them to leave. All right. Did he leave? No. <clears throat> um, once these other folks came over to uh, tell him to leave, did that change your level of concern with what he was doing? Uh, yeah. In what way? Um, it was a little confusing and also concerning why he wasn't leaving. He could have just removed himself from the situation like everyone asked him to. Did, did he ever tell you why he wanted to stay near your group? No. Is it fair to say that at some point you and your friends uh, were laughing at him? Yeah. And why were you doing that? Uh, we thought he was just really weird, to be honest. Do you remember how many folks were in the group that came over to help you guys? Uh, no. <clears throat> do, do you know how many times you told um, Mr. Mew or you and your group told Mr. Mew to leave, leave you alone? More than I can count. All right. Your Honor, we're going to show st uh, still 1219 from Exhibit 3. Exhibit three. <clears throat> All right, Ryan, do you see the picture that's on the screen in front of you? Yes. That's still, still number 1219 from the video. Can you tell us who's in this picture? Um, Isaac Owen, and then uh, I can't quite tell who that guy on the left is. All right. 
Um, is Isaac, which one is Isaac? Uh, purple shorts. Uh, is he wearing a hat or not wearing a hat? Wearing a hat. What is Isaac doing in this picture? Um, holding Owen. It looks like an uh, arm towards Owen and looking at Mr. Mew, maybe. Uh, the person on the right, who's that? Owen Pelquin. Uh, he was also in your group? Yes. Uh, what's he doing at that point? Um, it looks like saying something to Mr. Mew. All right. Um, where were you on that, if you remember, where were you in location to this picture, or in relation to this picture? Um, I believe I was near Juwan and Landon. Back behind the tubes? Yep. Juwan's the person taking the video? Yes. Now we're going to show still number 1279. All right, Brian, this is uh, still frame 1279 from the video. Um, what does this uh, picture show? Um, Isaac with his hands raised. All right, does he have anything in his hands? I uh, know. Um, who's that in front of Isaac? Uh, Mr. Mew. Isaac's hands open or closed in fists? Uh, open. Can you tell or do you remember what he was doing with his hands at that point? Uh, no, it just looks like he has his hands raised. I'm going to show you now still 1297 from the video. Uh, who is in this picture? Uh, me. That's you on the left? Yep. Holding onto the tubes? Yes. Uh, Mr. Mew on the right? Yes. Is that Isaac, uh, part, part of Isaac's arm in that photo? Uh, yes, it looks like it. All right, do you have anything in your hand in this photo? Uh, no. Your other, uh, referring to your right hand, your left hand you can't see, right? Yeah, I didn't have anything in my left hand either, though. All right. I'm showing you still frame 2596 uh, from the video. Can you tell us uh, what that is? Uh, me. All right, and uh, on the right, who's that, if you know? Uh, I don't recognize her. Is that one of the folks that came over to uh, yeah. help you out? Do you have anything in your hands there? No. Um, at that point, uh, you appear to be smiling? Yeah. While you were having this argument with Mr. Mew and trying to figure out what he was doing, um, were you able to see his face? Uh, yeah. Did he look to be frightened? Uh, no. He's what smiling. kind of facial expression did he have? He was smiling. Um, while you were having this, this argument with him, did he, were you able to tell whether he had anything in his hands? No. Uh, did you ever see him holding a knife? No. Fair to say the video shows that the incident happened pretty fast. Yeah. Um, while the two women are talking to Mr. Mew, um, what happened next? What did he do? Um, he punched one of the girls in the face. You remember which one it was? Um, I believe the blonde one. Not All right. 100% sure, though. And looking back at the photo that we have up, which is 2596, is that where you were standing when he punched the, the blonde woman in the face? Uh, relatively, yeah, yeah. So fairly close? Yeah. <clears throat> Prior to uh, Mr. Mew punching the blonde woman, had you seen anybody strike him in any fashion? No. You didn't see anybody punch him? No. Uh, when you say he punched the lady, is it possible that he was flailing his arms to protect himself or something along no, those lines? It was looked like he struck her definitively with his right hand. After the blonde uh, woman was punched, uh, what happened next? Did um, who... I believe her friends tried to come to her rescue and push Mr. Mew to the ground and hit him and pushed him again. You saw that? Yeah. Uh, did you see him in the water? Yes. Um, do you remember how many times he was hit when he was in the water? Um, two or three, maybe, I believe. All right. Um, at some point, uh, did he get on his hands and knees? Uh, yeah. Uh, what happened next? Um, he 
got up, swinging his knife and stabbing everyone. All right. At that point, did you know that he had a knife in his hand? Um, yeah, well, once I saw, I didn't know until I saw the person standing next to me who had his whole stomach cut open. And yeah. The person who got his whole stomach cut open, was he holding any kind of knife? No. Was anybody, did you see anybody in the, the group that came over to help you um, have any kind of weapons? No. Did you, what did you do after you realized that uh, the one gentleman had, had, had his uh, belly slit open? Um, I was in shock. I didn't really know what to do. I tried to, to tell my friends because I'd make sure they were seeing what I was seeing. And then I went and stood in our tubes. You left the, the general area? Yeah. Um, are you aware that um, Isaac had been stabbed? Um, not for like a minute. Eventually, did you realize that, that Isaac was down? Yes. Did you see him in the water? Yes. Did you see a wound on his body? Yes. Uh, where was it? Um, his upper chest. Was he bleeding? Uh, yes. Um, ultimately, did you um, and then the rest of your group or or attempts made to help Isaac get to shore? Yes. Who did that? Um, Owen and Alex. All right, and where were you at that point? Um, I was still standing in the tubes. Were you injured at all? No. Did you ever lay a hand on Mr. Mew? No. After you realized that folks had been stabbed, did you see what Mr. Mew did? Uh, no. Did you see where he went? Mm-mm. Is that a no? Yeah, no. Sorry. Okay. We're going to show you uh, still frame 3177. Uh, can you tell us who's in this picture that you know of? Um, the only person I recognize is myself. All right, you're in the blue trunks in the middle? Yes. Is this the point to where uh, Mr. Mew had punched uh, the blonde woman? Yes. Did you take a step forward? Uh, yes. Uh, why'd you do that? Uh, in her defense to help protect her. All right. Did you end up doing anything to help protect her? No. Um, I think you already testified some other gentleman took care of that. Yes. <clears throat> Whereabouts on her body did uh, Mr. Mew punch the blonde woman? Um, I believe in her face. <coughs> Say that again. In her face, I believe. All right, at some point then, um, did you go to the area where um, Isaac was being uh, laid on the, the shore of the river? Yes. Did you, the rest of your group also end up there yes um, did anybody call 911 if you know oh uh, yes you know who did that uh not i think a lot of people did i don't know specifically were there some folks that stopped to render aid to isaac yes um, was one of them a nurse yes um, what kind of aid did she give isaac um i wasn't over there i'm not sure all right did you see anybody doing cpr on him uh i wasn't close enough all right <clears throat> At some point, did the police arrive on the river? Yes. They waded through the water to get to where you folks were? Yes. Did you speak to the police officers? Uh, after, yes. Up on the shore? Yep. Um, at some point, uh, was Isaac taken off the river? Yes. Um, was he ultimately put in an ambulance and taken to a hospital? Yes. Did you follow? Yes. Um, you know, do you remember which hospital they brought him to? Uh, is it Lakeview? Right. Daughter. When you were at Lakeview Hospital, did you speak with an officer there as well? Yes. Um, <clears throat> even though this incident happened uh, almost two years ago, uh, do you still remember the face of the person who did this? Yes. Do you see him in the courtroom here? Yes. You point him out and say what he's wearing? He's wearing a black suit, black pants, brown shoes. Your Honor, ask the record to reflect identification of the defendant. Next question, please. 
Nothing further. Mr. Senator Trophis. Judge, the nine second video is on exhibit two also, which the state also moves to admit. Any objection? No, sir. All right. It's received. Okay. Go ahead. Very good. Okay, thanks. Um, Do you need a break? No, I just don't want it on the. Can you? Yeah. I don't, the jury shouldn't see my screen. Okay. It's cleared. So, Mr. Nelson, you um, provided an interview uh, with the. Clear it. Monitor's off. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, with an investigator, uh, Dittman, do you remember that? Yes. Okay. And to start with, one of the things that uh, Officer Dittman was interested in was how much alcohol you had consumed that day. Do you yes. remember that? Mm hmm Okay. And uh, he told you you weren't going to get in any trouble for anything. He just wanted the truth, right? Yes. Okay. And you indicated to him, uh, well, he initially asked you if you guys were drinking any... Uh, any hard alcohol, right? Yep. And you said that you weren't? Yep. That's a lie, right? Uh, no, I myself was not drinking hard alcohol. You guys brought Tito's vodka in water bottles and were doing shots on the river? Uh, I wasn't, but other my friends were. Just... Okay, and you were asked um, about Isaac drinking that day, Yes. Right? And you had told Officer Dittman that you think you had three or four drinks. Yes. And you said... I think Isaac had about the same. Yes. Okay. Are you aware that Isaac's alcohol level was a point, almost a point two two? Object, Your Honor. I was not aware of that. Hold Foundation. on. Let's, come on up. We've got a sidebar right now as you're watching live coverage here of the Apple River stabbing trial here on CBS News Minnesota. And while we have this moment, I do want to note that for those of you that are expecting to see the four at the top of the hour with Aaron Hassanzada and Jeff Wagner, if we are still in session here, we will uh, continue here on the stream. And if you want to see the four, you'll need to tune in to WCCO on TV. And as soon as proceedings for the day and we will then join the four already in progress here on CBS News Minnesota. It appears things are back in motion in the courtroom. Um, Isaac Schumann's uh, blood alcohol concentration was a point two one nine. Uh, no, I was not aware. Okay, but you say that you guys were about the same, right, in alcohol? Well, I, I was just a guess. He asked me to provide an estimate, and I did. I wasn't keeping track of other people's drinks. Right, but you provided that your estimate and yeah. his. Your drinking and his drinking were pretty close. Yes. So you were impaired, yes? Um, slightly, yes. Okay. And you were asked uh, and you gave some answers regarding your initial contact with Mr. Mew. Do you remember that? Yep. Okay. And you had said, if I have it right, uh, he snorkeled by us and didn't say anything. Yep. Okay. Your interview with Detective or Investigator Dittman, you indicated, yeah, so this weird guy, he was wearing a snorkel at first, came up to us and was kind of like talking to us, and we were a little weirded out, right? Yep. So which one's true? Um, I don't remember him saying anything. Okay, so this, when did you give the statement to Investigator Dittman? Um, was that the one at the bank or the hospital? How many interviews did you give? Two. When did you give them, if you remember? Um, one was on the bank after the incident, and then one was at the hospital. Is your memory better back then about what happened, or is it better today? Um, I'm not sure. Well, do you remember things that happened closer in time to the event, or as more time goes by? Um, I think I remember them both the same. So if something happened two years ago, you would remember it the same as if you were giving that statement a day or two after? Uh, yeah, I would try. Okay. So you don't recall him saying anything to you guys, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. But you all were saying something to him, weren't you? Yes. 
Yeah. You didn't tell that to Investigator Dittman, did you? Um, I don't remember. You left out the fact that you guys started taunting him and tormenting him. Right? After we told him to leave, yes. Well, I'm talking about the first time. Not the second time that we've seen the video. The first time we haven't seen the video for yet. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that incident? Yes. Okay. You don't tell Investigator Dittman about what you guys were doing to Mr. Mew at that point, do you? Uh, no. Why not? I just didn't think it was relevant. You didn't think it was relevant on this person that you're saying uh, did all these things to your friends? Wasn't relevant that you had contact with him earlier in that day? It was this, It was like minutes, seconds before. It wasn't like earlier in the day. It was around the same time. Right, and you didn't think it was relevant that you would inform him that you were taunting, you guys were taunting Mr. Mew and calling him names, right? Uh, no. Okay. I'm going to show you what has been marked as exhibit number two. I'm going to play you a short video and tell, ask you if you remember the video. Okay. okay. We're going to keep the screens blank until you tell us you're ready. Does that mean you're ready or are you yes. all right? <laughs> yes, we're ready, Judge. I apologize. Playing uh, the nine second video on exhibit two. Trying to. Grown man trying to have sex with little girls. What the hell? What the fuck? He's the raper. So he's, he's walking by you guys. He's not right on top of you there, is he? Uh. He was previously, but not that in that moment. No, he's not. So your friend just didn't get that on video? No, we started taking a video once he was being weird towards us. We wouldn't have videoed him just out of the blue. So when he was just walking by there and your friend just started saying, you can't have sex with little girls, right? Uh, that was after he was snorkeling under our tubes without saying anything. Where do you tell... Officer Investigator Dittman that he was snorkeling underneath your tubes. By our tubes. Oh, so by your tubes, not underneath your tubes. Misspoke. I apologize. Okay. So he's snorkeling by your tubes. Yep. And you guys start calling him names. No, we asked what he was doing and who he was, why he was there. Because it was, we found it a little weird that he was not in a tube like everyone else, but he was snorkeling right by our tubes. And so we asked him what he was doing. He never said anything. So then. Uh, we started calling him names, yeah. Okay. And the purpose of call You don't know him, do you? No. The purpose of calling a grown man that you've never met a raper? That wasn't me. Okay. The purpose of... Um, d do you know why that was said? Uh, no. To your knowledge, had Mr. Cockfield ever met Mr. Mew before? No. Okay. You think it was funny? Uh, no. Did you ever tell him to stop? No. Okay. And shortly after this is when Mr. Mew moves toward your tubes. Is that right? Yeah, when he runs at us. Okay. And your statement to um, Investigator Dittman is that Mr. Mew was standing over your tubes. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yes. Okay. Do you know why he came up to your tubes? Uh, no. Was Juwan Cockfield holding a camera at that time? Uh, yes. I'm sorry? Yes. Okay. And to your knowledge, Mr. Mew walks, he comes up to your tubes, then he walks around the tubes and actually starts to walk away from you guys, doesn't he? Uh, yeah. Okay. So you're saying, your group is saying, get away, go, and he's doing that, right? Uh -huh. Not really. You just said he was walking away. But he didn't leave. He didn't walk away. He just walked a couple of steps and then stayed near. And you guys follow? No. You don't You don't advance toward him? Your group doesn't advance we toward him? We stayed by our tubes. We were, as you saw in the still frames, I'm standing right next to our tubes. You showed us the still frame, or you, we saw the still frame involving Isaac mm -hmm. Schumann, right? Yeah. When he's got his arms up in the air like this, right? Yes. He's not standing next to his tube, is he? Um, uh, 
I don't know. He might be. I, he might be able to see this tubes in the picture. I can't remember. He's confronting Mr. Mew, isn't he? No, he was, had his hands up, raised. He was telling him to leave also. There was no confrontation at that point. I guess what I'm trying to ask you here, Mr. Nelson, is yeah. you guys told him to leave, so he moves away from you. Then your group moves toward him. That's true, right? Um, I don't think we really... He left. I, I, you keep saying he leaves, and I don't... He sure never me. really left. Leave. Can you just bring him? I'd rather just see the video. Sure. I'm going to show you, I'm just going to play for you a really short portion of the video that you've already seen. Okay. You are watching live coverage of the Apple River stabbing trial on CBS News Minnesota. It is just past four o'clock. If you are looking for the four with Jeff Wagner and Aaron Hassanzada, that right now is on TV. You can watch that on WCCO TV. We're going to stick with the trial right now until proceedings for the day. And at that time, we will join the four already in progress. Yes, we're ready. So at 27 seconds, uh, Mr. Nelson, I want you to watch this video first for a brief moment. On camera. Guys, let's go. 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 That we could watch the rest of the video and find out. Well, we will, but your group walks toward him, right? You keep saying they yeah. don't, and it's clear they're moving in his direction, yes? Yes. Okay. And you're doing, you're moving in his direction because you've testified that you're scared, right? We, our tubes, we're all still right around our tubes. That's our property, we're not, like... How come you don't go around him? You're, you've said that he could... What do you mean? Hold on. You said he could leave, right? Yeah. You could have walked away. You could have walked away, right? Yeah. You didn't walk away either, did you? No. And and that river, you don't... Anybody can use that river for being honest with one another, true? Yeah. Okay. So he doesn't have any more responsibility to walk away than you guys do, does he? Nope. Okay. And if I said to you that at some point... This other group starts coming over, is that right? Yes. Okay. And at that point, are you guys calling him a pedophile? Uh, I think, yeah, we were previously. You were previously calling him a pedophile? Like, in the, yeah, we were shouting, and that's, I think, why they came over. Okay. And I'm sorry, you said you believe that's why they came over? They heard us shouting, so I sure. believe, yeah. And certainly, to you, shouting pedophile could be something that would draw people's attention, right? Yes. So, you don't have any information that he was looking for small children, do you? No. Okay. Um, you'd agree calling somebody a pedophile isn't the same thing as calling somebody, like, a jerk or an a-hole or something like that, right? Yeah. Right? Yes. That's like, you're, you're, you're telling somebody, or you're telling people, this guy's looking to have sex with small children, right? I didn't say that. That's what a pedophile is, though, you know, right? Yeah. Okay. And you guys, to a man you've never met before, have no information about, people in your group are yelling on the river that he's a pedophile. Yes? Yes. Okay. And by your own admission, you believe that draws the attention of another group of people to come over. Yes. Okay. And do you remember independently, I know you've seen the video now, mm -hmm. do you remember independently... Um, he walks away from you guys kind of over to her, doesn't he? Like mm -hmm. he's walking toward you. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yes. Okay. And she, to your recollection, immediately tells him, go, get your fucking ass, go. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. So, in terms of what you can see, she doesn't wait to find out what's actually happening either, does she? 
Uh, no. Right? Yep. She just, she jumps into this and is yelling him for, yelling for Mr. Mew to go without knowing anything about what had happened based on the contact you had. Yes. Okay. And you describe her to police as, quote, getting in his face. Is yes. that fair? Yep. What do you mean by that? Uh, she was yelling at him to leave. Well, you could yell at me to leave from here, right? Yeah. She was right. She was close to him, right in front of him. Okay, so I won't, I won't invade your space, but yeah. what you're, in your definition of getting in someone's face is getting close to them? Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. And is it in part based on the volume of her voice, too? Yeah. Okay. So if I said to you what you observed is this woman... Her name is Madison Cohen, okay. but she is close to his face, yelling at him. Is that yes. fair? Yes? Yep. Okay. And it's, at that point, he's alone, to your knowledge, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. And that, that's a yes. I'm yes. Sorry. sorry. And initially, there's six guys in your group. Yep. And you say that two females come over. Yes. Okay. More people come over as this continues on. Is that true? Correct. Okay. So at one point, it's at least, if you know, it's at least 10, 12 versus 1, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. And do you, see, well, can I ask you this? Would, do you believe that the situation was getting, that the temperature was rising in terms of the situation as time was passing? Um, maybe a little, yeah. Okay, so it started out maybe here, and as time is going, the blonde shows up, it starts getting more and more heated, is that fair? Uh, a little, yeah. Okay. So in a situation where it's getting more and more heated, would you agree that a physically putting your hands on another person in that situation could be a show of aggression? I don't object, Your Honor, that calls for a conclusion. Sustained. Did you see Madison Cohen, the blonde girl, mm -hmm. put her hands on Nick Mew? No. Did you see her at any point move him or redirect him with her hands? No. Okay. So you had said um, that him, his presence here made you afraid. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you, do you recall ever saying personally mm -hmm. in your contact, you got 10 seconds? No, I don't remember saying that. So you're not saying that you said it? I don't remember saying that, no. Okay. Do you recall other people in your group? Do you remember hearing that being said? No. Okay. To you is a statement, if I said to you, you got 10 seconds, is that something that you would take as a show of aggression? Objection, Your Honor. It's the same objection. It's what? It's the same objection. It's, it's, it's Steve. Can you play the video? So I need you to listen to this, okay. um, Mr. Nelson, and it might take more than once, but I want you to listen to hear if you hear someone in your group saying that, okay? I'm going to play from the 35-second mark to the 45-second mark. I think it happens at the 39 second or the 39 40. Please tell us when you're ready for the video. Ready. somebody say you got 10 seconds right yeah okay and that based on that's not mr. Mew talking right no okay so somebody in your group is saying you've got 10 seconds uh, yeah 
Okay. And at that point, are you still frightened? Uh, just more weirded out now. Okay, so it goes from frightened to weirded out. Yeah, he moved away from us a little bit, so it was more. It was more scared when he ran at us and grabbed our tubes, and then it became more like, "Who's this guy?" I'm more weirded out. Okay, did it go from then weirded out to not really afraid at all? Yeah. Right. Um, there comes a point that you've seen on here where. You your group has kind of surrounded Mr. Mew, and you're all taunting and pointing at him. Is that right? I want to object, Your Honor, to the, the term surrounded. I think it's a mischaracterization. Of the Why not? All right, we've got a sidebar once again. I do want to remind those of you who may be looking for the four you can tune in right now to WCCO TV. You will find that there as soon as proceedings wrap up for the day. We'll do a quick wrap here and then take you back to the four already in progress at that time. So far today, we've heard opening statements from the prosecution and Mr. Mew's defense. Uh, right now, the state has begun to call witnesses. We heard from Stephen Kaufman, the owner at River's Edge Campground, and Ryan Nelson, who right now is on the stand. Great. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. So is it fair to say at that point the fear has left you? Um, yeah. Okay. And are you, do you personally feel more confident because the other group has come over? Um, maybe a little. Okay. So fair if I said strength in numbers. The more people that are around, the more confident you're becoming. Is that fair? Um, I just, I guess I lost fear that he was going to do something weird to us, yeah. Okay, and the other people coming over helped you lose that fear? Uh, yeah, we could, we didn't, yeah. Because you had a lot of people around, right? Yeah. Now, can I ask you, um, I don't want to get too close to you, but you say that, if this is fair, Madison Cohen, blind girl. Yep. Is is she in his face when she gets punched? Um, I would say she's at the same distance she was the whole time, so yeah. Okay, so she's in his face, right? Sure, yeah. Would you say that's in his personal space? Um, maybe. Okay. So, based on your recollection, she may be standing in his personal space yelling at him, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, you... Can you tell me, you said on direct examination that Mr. Mew punches her in the face with his right hand. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yes. You believe that to be true? I believe he struck her with his right hand, yes. Okay. Are you aware that at the time that he would have struck her, he was holding onto a knife? Uh, no, I was not aware. Okay. If I told you that fact is true, would that change your opinion? No. You would still say, a man who's holding a knife struck her in the face with his fist. Uh, yeah, his, the knife is not in front of his fist. Okay, so you think this is how, you think that the knife is in his hand and he comes across and punches her in the face? Yes. Okay. And do you remember, if, would he have hit her on the left or the right side? Uh, the right side, I believe. She fell down to the, towards left her okay so you believe I, this sorry i'm getting confused I, left side i guess okay so you believe he's holding a knife in his hand and he punches her in the left side of her face yeah okay do you see any marks on her uh no i didn't i don't think they had time to be marks or really check before everything happened okay but you don't my question is you don't see her have any marks on her face true no, I didn't check okay. for marks. Okay. And you say that she goes down, <clears throat> is that right? Yes. All right.
So I'm going to show you. Okay. You're going to need a JPEG or the 26. 2644, the, the photo of it. Okay. Okay. So now at 2644, you're, I think you've testified you're moving forward. Yes. Okay. Well, I, I do. Keep going. So we've gone from 2644 to 2653, right? Mm -hmm. That blonde is the girl that you said was punched in the face and went down, right? Yeah. Okay. Would you agree she's holding on to her drink? See that? Uh, yes. And can we go one or two more, Aaron? Looks like she's got a cell phone tucked in her yeah. trunks on the top. Yes? Yes. Okay. Do you agree she doesn't go down, right? Um, if that was the woman that was punched, then... Well, she's the blonde, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. So do you agree now looking at this, she doesn't go down? Yeah. Okay. You believed that she did go down, though? Uh, yeah, maybe it was just a stumble on... I guess I'm not sure. My attention was quickly averted to Mr. Mew after that. Okay. All right. Um... You had provided information or a statement to Officer Didman. Um, he had asked you about any contact um, that Isaac may have had with yeah. Mr. Mew. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. And I think you had indicated that you never saw that happen. You never saw Isaac make physical contact with Mr. Mew. Yes. Okay. Um, have you seen, you watched the video, right? Yes. Okay. So now you're aware that Isaac has his hands around Mr. Mew's throat? I didn't know that he had his hands around his throat, no. You didn't see that? No. Okay. Is that something that you saw? No. That, he was, he was, uh, that was pretty late. That was, I think Isaac was the last one stabbed on video. And so by that time I was focused on the guy next to me who was had his whole stomach cut open. Okay, but I guess my point is, initially you say you didn't see Isaac make contact with yep. him. You see on that video somebody with their hands around Mr. Mew's throat, right? Yeah. Okay. And you don't know if that's Isaac or not? Uh, no. Okay. We can watch it again and I could tell you what I think, but I don't... Is he wearing a bracelet, like a gold bracelet on his wrist? I don't remember. Okay. Now, um... Can I ask you this? No, you'd agree with this. On that video, nobody is stabbed until Mr. Mew is punched in the face and knocked in the water, right? You agree to, with that? Yeah. Okay. And so you would agree that the people that are injured with the knife, that all happens after Mr. Mew has been knocked in the water, punched, slapped, pushed, right? Yes. Okay. And you don't... Um, you don't attack Mr. Mew, do you? No. Okay. And he doesn't do anything to you, does he? No. It's all Tarsi. It's just messed up. Come to exhibit, uh, three. So, Ryan, the, the, the Tropic Trop Trop has asked you about Mr. Mew walking uh, away from your group of tube, your group of tubes after he had run up on you. Yes. Um, did he walk down river or up river? Um, back up towards that other group that. Okay. When he, I'm asking about when he first stepped away. Down river. All right, and is that the direction your tubes were going? Yeah. Uh, so he was between you and the exit. Yes. <clears throat> 
um, you had indicated that you took, you were holding on to the tubes. You didn't want to lose the tubes, obviously. Yes. Was, um, you paid money for them. Mm -hmm. um, was the natural flow of the river carrying your tubes towards him? Yes. <clears throat> A lot of questions about your memory. Um, you you do recall giving your statements to the police, right? Yes. And would it be fair to say that this has been so long now that your statements to police were given when your memory was probably a little fresher than it is right now? Objection leading. Sustained. Is your memory better now? Mr. Tarofasi had asked you if your memory is better now than it was back then. Yes. All right. Would it, do you think that you remembered things better when you first talked to the police or now? Or the same? I think you said the uh, same. Probably the same, yeah. All right. Uh, do you recall uh, talking to the officers about the names that you'd called, Mr. Mew? Um, no. All right. You might have done that? Maybe. <clears throat> but it refresh your memory to uh, see a portion or hear a portion of what you told the officers with regard to calling him a pedophile? Sure. And the point is, Mr. Troff, as he asked you why you left out the fact that you called him a pedophile. Do you remember yeah. that? Uh, in fact, you didn't leave that out? Your Honor, can I approach the witness to show him a digital copy of the transcript of his interview with Investigator Dittman? Is there a transcript that was provided by Mr. Nelson? Okay. For what purpose? To refresh his memory as to what he told the investigator Dittman about what they were calling him, calling Mr. Mew at the time. You say he had trouble remembering? I lost that. You did. Mr. Tarofasi indicated that Mr. Nelson, Ryan Nelson, did not tell police that they were calling him a pedophile, uh, which I intend to refresh his memory to show that he did tell the police that at the time immediately after the, the incident. Any objection? If he needs his memory refreshed, he can do that. I, I, Judge, I don't know if I missed it either, so. Yeah, I'm yeah. not hearing the magic words is, I guess, what I'm driving at. That this is going to help him refresh his memory. It's two sentences. It, I think you're missing the point. All right. I'll move on, Your Honor. Uh, did, is it possible that you told Officer Dittman or Investigator Dittman something back then that you don't remember now? Yes. And it would being able to uh, see a transcript of what you said refresh your memory as to what you told them? Yes. How can I do it, Your Honor? Uh, on what issue? I don't know. Sustained. Objection sustained. Can we approach, Judge? Yes. <laughs> All right, once again, we have a discussion off mic with the judge. This is regarding some of what Isaac Schumann's best friend, Ryan Nelson, told police. Uh, there's a conversation right now about sharing part of his statement to try to recollect his memory of what happened on that day. So they're gonna discuss this right now. He is the second, we should mention, Ryan Nelson, who's 18, the second to take the stand for the state uh, following opening statements. Uh, previously, we heard from Stephen Kaufman, who is the owner of River's Edge Campground, to get a little bit of information just uh, about the area of the river where this took place. Looks like conversations are ongoing there. I do want to mention that we will have uh, more coverage tonight at 5 and 6 on WCCO. Our Jonah Kaplan is in the courtroom. And tonight at 10, our David Schumann will have more on this first day in the trial from our legal analyst, Joe Tamburino, who has uh, joined us throughout uh, the day and will be with us throughout the trial as well. Mew faces one count of first-degree murder as well as four counts of attempted first-degree murder for the other four who were stabbed along with Isaac Schumann, who was killed. Uh, he has pleaded not guilty to all charges and could be sentenced to life in prison if convicted. We've seen a lot of 
uh, images here, still images, which there at one point, one of the attorneys said there are over 4,800 still images taken from video that was shot on cell phones uh, when this incident happened in July of 2022. And we also saw some, not all, of the raw video. Exhibit two was the first time that we saw a piece of video, and that was before we started to hear from Ryan Nelson. We also saw exhibit three just a little while ago, which was uh, one of the still pictures. And we're going to see various clips of this video and uh, breakdowns, sometimes frame by frame, of the still images uh, throughout this trial. It appears that this conference is now ending. <laughs> Brian, do you remember telling an officer uh, what kind of names you were telling, calling Mr. Mew at the time? Uh, no. All right, and if... Um... Cast a brochure. All right, brochure. He's indicated he doesn't remember. You have to ask him what will help him remember. But you, if you saw a transcript of the, your interview with the investigator Divin, would that help you remember? Oh, yes. Now you can approach. <laughs> Show your digital copy of the transcript and just read the highlighted portion. No. Oh, read it all now. Read it to yourself. Sorry. That help you uh, remember what you told the investigator, did then? Yes. What did you tell him about the names you were calling the investigator? I said we were all calling him a pedophile and saying this is weird and he needs to get out of here. So that wasn't inf was that information you were trying to keep from the police? No. <clears throat> At that point, were you aware that there had been a video made by John Cockfield of the incident? Yes. Were you aware that the police had it? Yes. At the time that uh, Mr. Mew ran up and grabbed onto your tubes, um, did he grab them in an area where some of your friends had their legs positioned? Yes. Injection leading. Sustained. Where did he grab your, the, your tubes? Um, where we were sitting. Uh, was that, were there people in those areas? Yes. What parts of their bodies, uh, if any, were close to where he grabbed? Uh, legs. Did you know whether or not he was trying to grab onto their legs? Objection, no. speculation. Mm -hmm. Sustained. Mr. Chirafasi had asked you about someone in your group saying you got 10 seconds. Do you know who that was directed at? No. You know who said it? No. Uh, you heard, did you hear it on the video when he played it for you twice? Uh, yes. Did you hear Mr. Mew being described as the person who had 10 seconds? No. <clears throat> Mr. Chirafasi had asked you about whether you had less fear of Mr. Mew once um, the other folks came up. Um, why did you have less fear? Um, I believe they were going to help us and help us get him away. Were these other folks kids or adults? Young adults. After uh, the blonde woman, Madison Cohen, is punched, did you take the time to check to see if she had any injuries to her face? No. Uh, you've seen the video of the of the incident here today? Yes. You had indicated earlier, I think, that everything sort of happened right after that, right? Yes. Did you see where Madison Cohen ended up, where she ended up going no. after she was punched? No. You didn't? Did you... Um, you indicated that you, th you thought she fell down, and then on cross-examination you said that she may have just stumbled backwards. Do you, do you remember specifically whether she fell or stumbled backwards? No. But as you sit here today, is that what your impression of what happened was at the time? Yes. Mr. Trofsky had asked you about uh, Madison Cohen, the blonde woman, being in Mr. Mew's face. I'm going to show you a slide, a still. It is 
number 2593. Tell us when you're ready. We're ready. Uh, do you see that uh, still frame from the video? Yes. Is this what you were referring to? Yes. Is that where she was uh, located when he punched her? Um, I believe so. Do you remember where you were um, in relation to this photo off off screen uh, at that time? Um, to the left side of the women, the right side of Mr. Mia. Um, when she was punched, did you hear an impact? Yes. <clears throat> When you gave your two statements to the police, both one at the riverbank and one at the hospital, did you tell them that he had punched her? Yes. All right. Nothing further. Mr. Shroffsey? We would agree that when Mr. Mew moved over to go talk to Madison Cohen, you could have all just went right by. Yes. But you stayed, right? Yep. And you were asked about just the 10 seconds, right? You got 10 seconds. Yes. You didn't believe that was directed at you, did you? I didn't hear it. Okay. Would it make sense to you that it would be directed at Mr. Mew based on what was happening? I'm not sure. I don't know who said it. Okay. And you said that your fear was reduced once more people came, is that right? Yes. Okay, so um, tell me if this is fair. When it was the six of you, you had, according to you, some level of fear. When it became 13, you didn't have any fear? I had less fear, yes. Okay. And you knew th through this whole thing he was alone, right? Yes. Okay. So at one point, you know it's 13 versus 1, yes? Yes. Okay. Now, you said that you remember Ms. Cohen falling, and now you, you think that might be incorrect. Is that true? Uh, falling or stumbling. Lebron, I'm sorry. Yeah. That you say she was punched and she fell. Some sort of falling or stumbling motion, yes. I believe that's true. Okay. You'd agree that she never drops her drink in that picture, right? Yeah. And her phone doesn't leave her body, right? Yeah. Mr. Nelson, I appreciate your time today. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. You can step down. Is he released from his subpoena? No. No? Okay. Is there a coordinator here that can assist him? All right. Uh, she'll give you further instructions about what to do and where to go. Please leave the exhibit with the attorney. All right. Move for the admission of 62. Any objection? 62 is received. Are there other exhibits that need to be addressed? Uh, 25, plus 25 admitted? Yes. Uh, we're waiting for some foundation on 27. All right. Members of the jury, uh, it's 4.30, so we're going to break for the day. Um, in a moment, the bailiffs will take you out. Uh, I do have a few instructions for you before you leave. One. Uh, no discussion about this case with others, not amongst yourselves, not with the lawyers, not with the members of the public, not with the media. Uh, do not talk about the case when you get home. I know it's going to be tough, but you have to decide this case only on the evidence presented at trial, and you cannot be influenced by others. Uh, second instruction, uh, no independent research or investigation. Uh, do not go to the Internet to look up things that you think may be helpful. Do not visit the site. Do not look at maps. Uh, again, the attorneys have to present the evidence for you to decide here in the courtroom. Uh, third, uh, do not watch or read any media reports or social media posts about the trial. Um, frankly, you're getting a front row, front row seat to this entire trial. Anything that you see on the Internet uh, could be misleading. Uh, the final instruction is come back tomorrow morning. We need you all at 8 o'clock before we can get started. The bailiff will give you uh, new directions about the entrance. You're not going to come in the main door. There's a new door that you're going to come in. 
Uh, he will give you the instructions about uh, where that door is. Uh, there's also special parking for you in the morning. Uh, please use it uh, so that you are uh, segregated from the rest of the public. Please take the jury out. All right. And with that, day one of the Apple River stabbing trial comes to an end in St. Croix County Court. We've been bringing you live coverage here since this morning with opening statements uh, from both the prosecution and the defense, one painting uh, Mr. Mew, Nikolai Mew, as an aggressor, and the defense saying that he was attacked by a mob of 13 in this situation. Uh, of course, we're going to continue to bring you live coverage of this trial here on CBS News Minnesota. Also want to note that our Jonah Kaplan is in the courtroom today. He will have live reports tonight on WCCO News at 5 and 6. And our David Schumann will have more tonight on the news at 10. This ends our coverage for now. We're going to take you now to the four already in progress on WCCO News. Notice that theme we got going on here. Although not in the top five, Minnesota isn't too far behind when it comes to heavy drinking. Places like Utah, New Mexico, and Georgia are at the bottom of the list. All right, now to a new study that will have dog lovers intrigued here. Researchers believe that dogs can understand that certain words refer to specific objects, so basically how humans communicate. The study says this is the first evidence of brain activity for this type of comprehension in a non-human creature. In the study, eight 